All right, I think we might just about be done loading people on. I think, uh, I know there's still, people are still signing on, but let's get started. So we don't penalize you all for coming early uh, on, on time. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kome Ajise. I'm the executive director of the Southern California Association of Governments, uh, otherwise known as SCAG. And I'd like to welcome you all to SCAG's Housing Element Digital, Digital Workshop today. Uh, I think it's one of two that we're going to have. Um, and um, um, you know, my staff will roll their eyes, but many of you may have heard me say, say this uh, often that I think, and I think uh, you, you would agree with me that the housing crisis that we have right now that we've been living with, uh, not just in Southern California, but, uh, but in, in the entire state, frankly, across the nation, is an existential issue for us, more so in Southern California, where we feel a stewardship obligation to keeping the region vibrant and, and livable. Um, one of our main programs at SCAG has been to assist our jurisdictions as they develop their housing elements. And, and this is the time because a lot of folks are beginning to gear up for the housing element update that's due uh, in another year or so. In the past couple of years, the state has directed more funds towards housing and in partnership with HCD and, and the new funding that we got from the state. SCAG is providing more technical assistance, um, which includes hosting workshops like this, um, uh, which uh, this workshop co co consists of two days, today and a week from today. So for those who uh, might want to note that on their calendars, uh, we're going to have one a week from today. At this time, um, I want to introduce our president, um, the president of SCAG, uh, Mr. Rex Richardson. Um, Rex is a council member from the 9th district uh, in the beautiful city of Long Beach. And uh, he has um, began his work at SCAG as the president with, I think, an incredible pace in terms of leadership for things like this. And I know housing is, is, uh, is heavy on, on, on Rex's agenda uh, going forward. He's demonstrated his commitment to housing and more so social equity, which I think housing is heavily implicated in. And uh, without much further ado, um, Rex, the floor is yours. You're muted. Thanks, Tommy, for the introduction, uh, helping to set the stage for this really important conversation. I have to tell you, our city of Long Beach has been engaged in this housing element update uh, for, for a, a, a number of years. And it's, it's important. It, it helps set the stage for a, a host of social determinants that, outcome, that determine outcomes uh, for your entire life. Uh, I think, you know, I, I heard President Obama's remarks last night that stuck with me about um, the decisions we make, how they echo through generations. Um, when we think about our land use plans, our housing element, that's a tangible example of systems that we put in place that echo throughout generations and help to set the stage uh, for quality of life and other determinants uh, throughout generations. So we all know the importance of the housing element. We also know how important it is, uh, particularly now during, during the pandemic and the years to come after the pandemic, how important it is for us to accelerate housing production for all income groups, not, not, you know, not just some, but all of us. Uh, it's important to ensuring uh, economic inclusion. It's, it's important to ensuring uh, that we're able to address racial equity. Over these next two days, we have a number of sessions that will help housing element planners, practitioners, navigate new laws and guidelines for developing housing elements. And also we'll discuss technical assistance available from HCD and from SCAG to help you to prepare for your sixth, sixth cycle of our housing element. We'll have experts speak from HCD, from OPR and from SCAG to go over these important topics. We look forward to a great conversation on how you can use these tools to complete a successful housing element. Uh, today, we'll focus on new laws and guidance and technical assistance from HCD and SCAG. Next week's session, we'll focus on ADUs and site inventory analysis, along with some stories uh, from folks on the front lines and in the trenches. So we look forward to your participation today. We look forward to working with you and helping meet your, your community's housing goals. 
And uh, together, we look forward to working together, achieve our, address our housing needs across the region. So at this point, I want to hand it over to Mayan, uh, who's our incredible uh, planner here at, at SCAG, who's uh, deeply involved in this work. And she'll be emceeing the rest of this, this is the workshop. So uh, without further ado, Mayan, you have the floor. Great. Thanks, President Richardson. Um, and thanks, Kame, uh, for those uh, opening welcoming remarks. Um, as uh, they both mentioned, uh, we have a great agenda with a number of experts from HCD, OPR, and SCAG today. And this is a two-part workshop, so today we'll focus on new laws and guidance and technical assistance from HCD and SCAG, while next week's session will focus on ADUs and site inventory analysis. Um, and so before we start today, I did want to share with you a few housekeeping things. We have over 500 people registered for today's workshop. So to make sure we keep everything going smoothly, we won't be able to host verbal comments or questions today. But instead, if you do have a question, please enter them into the Zoom chat box if you're logging in through Zoom. If you're on live YouTube stream, uh, while there isn't a chat box feature, you can still email your questions directly to housing at skag.ca.gov. Uh, so um, even if we don't get to your questions today, um, so the panel uh, moderator, they'll be able to uh, pick out questions uh, that they can ask the panelists. But even if we don't get, them, get to them today, uh, we'll still post a list of questions and answers after the recordings are posted. So we are recording each of these sessions and we'll post them on our website. So with that, let's get started on our first panel today, new housing laws and new guidelines for general plan updates. And I'd like to introduce the moderator, Alicia James, Community Engagement Specialist from SCAG. Alicia? Today we are joined by representatives from HCD and the Governor's Office for Planning and Research to discuss new legislation re regarding uh, housing elements, compliance, and general plan updates. We are joined by HCD's Housing Policy Specialist, Sohab Mahmood, and HCD's Housing Policy Manager, Paul McDougall, who will speak about several statutes and their implementation. We are also um, joined by OPR Program Management Manager, Eric Dick-Cock, and OPR Senior Planner, Helen Campbell, to address new general plan requirements and also introduce their new site uh, check tool. So first, I would like to uh, welcome Sohab Mahmood and Paul McDougal. McDougal. Hi Alicia, thanks so much for introducing me. Um, again, my name is Soha Mahmood. I am from HCD, De California Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm a housing policy specialist within the Land Use and Planning Unit. I work on everything technical assistance. We have a TA program that we're rolling out in the last, we've been rolling out for the last year, um, and I lead that technical assistance program, and that touches on a lot of topics, um, including housing elements, planning grants, and different housing policy topics that seek to accelerate housing production. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my first presentation of the afternoon, which is on new laws. So, okay, thank you, Alicia. And then I'm gonna get set up here as well. Just give me one second. Oh, was that, was that me? Jennifer, the slides were up and they just went down, so we can't see it. Perfect. Thank you. Let me just open up my points as well. Okay. So, as um, much of SCAG staff mentioned earlier today, um, housing elements are helping set the stage for housing to occur in your communities. We understand that there's a lot of changes that you guys are probably aware of or probably want more guidance on around updating your housing elements. We also know that since 2017, we've had a lot of new laws that affect housing elements. Um, and so what I'm gonna do in this particular presentation is I'm gonna talk about a lot of the new laws affecting housing elements, except the site's inventory. So I wanna emphasize that, is that my presentation right now is to talk about all the other new laws. The site's inventory, as we all know, is a whole other beast of itself, and that's going to be presented next week. And we're going to go very much into detail on the site's inventory. Okay, it says I need to be louder. Sorry about that. Let me turn it up. 
hopefully that's helpful. Hopefully that's louder. Um, so again, uh, today I'm going to talk about the laws affecting everything but the site's inventory. Next week we'll go into greater detail on the inventory itself, the laws, and also hopefully some best practices and some strategies you can take back to your um, to your jurisdiction when you're updating your housing element. So uh, next slide, please. Oh. Okay. So this is just a summary slide of a lot of the new legislation from 2017 to 2019 that mainly affect the site's inventory and maybe other parts of the housing element, but not, sorry, mainly affect the housing element and all the different parts of the housing element, but some laws that affect um, not your exact housing element update, but affect the um, consequences of not updating your housing element. So um, we, for site inventory, different laws that have been passed was AB 1397. Most of you are probably familiar by the, uh, of this by now, hopefully, SB 6 and AB 1486. There were laws that affected your constraint section of your housing element, which is known as AB 879 and AB 1483. There were laws that were passed that affected housing element compliance and uh, consequences around housing element compliance or lack thereof. That was AB 101 and AB 72. And hopefully most of you are probably familiar of the affirmatively furthering fair housing law that affects your housing elements and other parts of housing, and that is AB 686. We also have laws that affect land use around homelessness, um, and that was AB 2162, AB 101, and AB 139. And lastly, we have other laws that affect land use in general, and that was SB 330, AB 671, AB 1763, and the known at loss law that got expanded. So I'm gonna go over, hopefully in detail, um, in this presentation on what those new laws are and what section of your housing element they affect and how to um, implement or how to incorporate those laws into your housing element. I'm hoping this session will be a very practical guide on helping you update your housing element. So rather than just explaining the law, but also helping you understand how do you actually implement that law within your housing element. So you don't, during your review process with HCD, where we don't come back and say, hey, you didn't do this in your housing element. This is just, again, one more step to help reduce our findings and help you guys update your housing elements and make the process go a little bit quicker. Next slide, please. So let's go into AB 686, which was affirmatively furthering fair housing. I know, I hope by now a lot of you guys have probably heard of this and we understand that there's some concern and fear around this law and how to really implement it within your housing element. I wanna emphasize that within this presentation, I'm just gonna talk about the law and maybe some best practices. Because right now, HCD is working on very, very specific guidance and best practices and examples on how do you really address AB 686 within your housing element. So like I said, we're working on guidance right now that hopefully is, will lay out in detail on how you should address this in your housing element. Right now, I'll t just talk about the law itself and some general, ideas, some general things you want to consider when updating your housing element. Also, for that guidance that I just mentioned, we hope to have that guidance out in anywhere from two to three months. We have made that a priority within our unit to make sure we are developing the guidance and it will go through our internal and external department review and we hope to have that out in again, the next two to three months. So again, AB 686 basically created new requirements for all states and local agencies and that includes cities, counties, housing authorities, and any local agency working on housing to ensure that their laws, their programs, and activities affirmatively further for housing. And they take no actions that are inconsistent with this obligation. And I'll talk about what does it mean to affirmatively further for housing. Next slide, please. So AB 686 requires that housing elements that are due on or after January 1st of 2021, so most of all of you, um, of next year must include an assessment of fair housing. So the development of the assessment of fair housing or a fair, a fair housing analysis must also include meaningful com community participation and outreach when you're updating the overall housing element and that also will touch on the assessment of fair housing. So when we talk about meaningful community outreach and participation, I want to also give a quick plug that on September 1st, HCD, so that's our team, is going to be doing another webinar specifically on how do you do public outreach and engagement for your housing element, especially given the current, the current time and the current environment. 
we know that you, most people will have to engage in virtual um, virtual community participation and engagement. And the September 1st webinar that HCD will be hosting will talk a lot about how do you engage, what are we expecting, and here are some best practices. So if you want to know more, if you want to learn more about how to do public engagement for your housing element, I highly recommend that you sign up for that webinar as well. So what does affirmatively further fair housing mean? Under state law, it means that you take meaningful actions that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities that are free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected classes. So meaningful actions mean addressing disparities in your housing needs in your community. It means replacing segregated living patterns with more integrated balanced community. And it means to transform your racially and ethnically concentrated of areas of poverty into areas of opportunity. And lastly, it means to foster and maintain compliance with all fair housing laws and housing laws in general. So if you see a lot of these areas where it says, take meaningful actions, replace segregated living patterns, transform your areas of um, concentrated areas of poverty, poverty into areas of opportunity, a lot of these areas are going to be addressed and implemented through your program section of your housing element. So I'm going to go a little bit more in detail, but I want you guys to start thinking about what are programs and what are strategies you could be doing as a community to start addressing things like your segregated living patterns, to start addressing your areas of poverty and making them into communities that have opportunity for your youth, for your families, and for your older generations. Next slide, please. So the first part of AB 686, this is really what I call the data and analysis section. And data analysis, or data in general, is going to help you inform or help inform what your program should look like. But first, you want to understand that data. You want to collect it, and you want to analyze it to see what is going on in your community around fair housing. So the statute says you need to have a summary of your fair housing issues. So you need to go ahead and collect a summary of what are your fair housing issues. You need to then assess your fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity as of right now. So what are you doing right now for fair housing enforcement and outreach? And you need to analyze your data and your, your data around integration and segre segregation patterns and trends. You need to analyze your data around racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. You need to analyze your data that speaks to the disparities of access of opportunity. And you want to analyze the data around disproportionate housing needs and any displacement risk. Now you're probably thinking, where do I get all this data? And how, I mean, where do you get it first? And then how do you analyze it? So SCAG and um, also HCD later in this, uh, later in today's workshop, will talk about some of the things that we're going to try to do to help you, to help provide that data for you so that you can analyze it. But also think about some nonprofits, advocacy organizations, and local partners that might have that data available for you. Also, that goes a lot, that touches a lot into your community outreach talking to your community in general about what do they see around um, segregation patterns and around areas that are concentrated with poverty. Lastly, you want to assess factors that have con contributed to fair housing issues in your community. So assessing what led to the fair housing issues that you're facing today and look at those da that data and start analyzing it because that analysis is, gonna, is going to inform a lot of your programs and what you're going to be doing during your planning period to address these issues. So again, this data and this analysis should be included as part of your housing element update. Again, I know you're probably thinking, how am I going to do it? And what do I do? And so, like I said, HCD will be developing very thorough guidance on how to do that and hopefully best practices and data sources so you can start working on this analysis in the coming months. Next slide, please. So now, so now you've looked at the data. You've hopefully analyzed it at this point. Now, based on the data and based on your analysis, you want to identify what are, your, what are your fair housing priorities and goals. So what is the highest priorities that you want to start addressing as a community that have limited housing choice or denied housing choice for your community members? What has limited or made it very difficult for communities or commu specific communities to access opportunity? Or what has negatively impacted fair housing and civil rights compliance? You want to identify what those priorities and goals are going to be, and how. And then in the program section, of course, you're going to you're going to figure out how you want to tackle those ideas, those priorities. 
Also, you want to identify clear milestones and metrics for determining your results. So what this means is once you've identified your goals, once you've come up with your program, you want to identify how you're going to measure those goals throughout the planning period, right? Because you can identify these programs, you can implement it, but you want to make sure that they're working. So identifying key aspects of these goals that are going to tell you if you're on the right track to addressing some of these issues, or maybe you need to pivot and come up with an, um, another set of programs or ideas. Also, um, something I threw in this slide, another impacted section of your housing element for 8686 is your site's inventory. And with your site's inventory, what that means is we're looking at, uh, the, the law states that throughout your community, sorry, throughout the community within your housing element, you want to affirmatively further fair housing. And that also means when you, how you identify your sites. You want to make sure you're identifying sites for, your, for all your arena groups throughout your community. You don't want to end up concentrating all of your arena sites for your lower income arena in just one area. Because again, when we're trying to address and replace segregated patterns and replace patterns of um, concentrations of poverty, um, if you're identifying all of your lower income arena sites in one particular area, you're not really replacing it. You want to create your, a balanced community that's throughout your area, throughout your community, or throughout your jurisdiction. You have sites for lower income families, you have sites for moderate income family, and you have sites that access, have, create access to more opportunities. So when you're identifying your sites, really think about, again, look at your data, think about where your communities are that have been negatively impacted, and make sure you're identifying sites throughout the community. Again, a lot more guidance on how you can do this and best practices will be coming through HC guidance. I keep, um, I keep emphasizing that because I know there are a lot of concerns around this analysis and a lot of worry about how are we going to do it, but HCD is committed along with SCAG to help you find the data and help you find the right tools to conduct this analysis for your housing element update. Next slide, please. So you've, identi you've, you've looked at the data, you found your data, you've analyzed your data, you've identified what are your priorities as a community to make sure you're addressing your data, the results of your data. Now you're going to develop ways to actually implement these priorities. You're going to develop strategies and actions that can implement your goals. And this will most likely, again, like I said, affect the program section of your housing element. And what does it mean to develop strategies and actions to implement these goals? Here is just a couple ways you can do that. And it's very broad and vague. And there's probably a long list, again, of strategies and programs you can be putting in place to address your data results from, from the fair housing data. Um, and again, I think a lot of it will speak will come from community outreach and speaking to stakeholders on what are real strategies for your community to address fair housing issues. But an example could be enhancing mobility strategies, encouraging to make encouraging development of affordable housing in all areas of opportunity. Um, and again, maybe that speaks a lot to the sites inventory, making sure your sites are throughout your community and not just in one specific area. May having place-based strategies to encourage community revitalization. So again, when I talked about transforming areas, concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity, that could be addressed through place-based um, place strategies. Also, preservation of existing affordable housing to make sure families can stay in the community that they've been living in and not be displaced. And again, other programs that can protect, protect existing residents from displacement. So specifically in your program, uh, the original program requirement or one of our core program requirements as part of updating your housing element is providing equal housing opportunities. Now, as per, 80, per AB 8686, you must now have a program that promotes and affirmatively further fair housing opportunities and promotes housing throughout the community for all communities of for all people of, of your community. Next slide, please. So that was AB 686. Like I said, it requires an analysis, a, a, a analysis for um, that will impact your housing needs section, mostly your program section and your site's inventory. Now I'm gonna go into laws that in fact impacted your governmental and non-governmental constraints section. Next slide, please. So the first law, this law was um, passed in 2017. It was AB 879. 
this part of this law affected your governmental constraints section. And what it basically said is that you want to make sure you're analyzing any local, include in your housing element and analyze any local adopted ordinances that impact the cost and supply of housing. It's very general. For we put examples like, do you have an inclusionary ordinance? Because that can impact the cost of supply of housing. Do you have a short-term rental ordinance? Because that can impact the cost of supply of housing. Or again, in your analysis and, and your review of, of your community, do you have other ordinances that might impact the cost and supply of housing? And what you want to do in this section is again, analyze, I mean, include that, hey, I have these ordinances, analyze how they might impact the cost of supply of housing. Maybe, maybe you real part of your analysis is they don't really impact the cost of supply of housing. In fact, they help support housing. Um, and or you might realize that I might need to amend my ordinance to make sure it's not negatively impacting the cost and supply of housing. But basically, that's that's the main focus of this part of AB 879 is just making sure you're analyzing any ordinances that might affect housing in a negative way and making sure including it and analyzing it within your governmental constraints section. Next slide, please. So another part of AB 879 impacted your non-governmental constraints section. So again, these are these are areas where you don't have control over, but maybe you can find ways to have programs to help address those areas. So one was analyzing and analyzing requests to develop at densities below the anticipated density in your community. Second, analyzing the length of time between receiving an approval for a housing element, for a housing development and submittal of an application for a building permit that could hinder and construct, hinder the construction of a construction towards a locality's arena. So what this means is, again, you're analyzing the length of time it takes for a developer to receive approval for a housing project and submitting a building permit and analyzing that time to see how long it takes for a developer to essentially get a building permit and start actually building that project that they were approved for. So, Hob, I apologize for interrupting. We just have about three to five more minutes left for this session. Oh, great. Well, I still have half the presentation, so I really should really speed it up. I am so sorry. Okay, thank you for letting me know. So next slide, please. So again, AB 879 affects your non-governmental constraints. It requires that, in addition, include an analysis of demonstrating any local efforts to address your non-governmental constraints. Again, this is you trying to make an effort that while these constraints are out of your control, you can find ways to incentivize or create programs that might address these constraints. Next slide, please. Okay, and AB 879 also, it impacts your program section. Essentially, uh, before you would have to address and remove, mitigate, or address and mitigate constraints uh, around governmental constraints, but now it also, um, the program requires that you address or mitigate constraints around non-governmental issues. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm actually going to skip um, one or two slides just to make sure we get to some of the most important parts of your housing element. So if you could skip another slide. Okay, so we'll go into AB 139, which also impacted a couple sections of your housing element, the special housing needs section, the development standards, so maybe your constraints section, your zoning for a variety of housing types, and your review and revise section. This was AB 139, which was passed as called the Emergency and Transitional Housing Act of 2019. Next slide, please. So one area it affects is your development standards for emergency shelter. In the past, you would demonstrate that you have off-street parking based on your demonstrated need. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. And now what it requires is that you only need to have sufficient parking for your emergency shelters for staff that are working at the emergency shelter. Next slide, please. Okay. And another section that it um, impacts is your review and revise section of your housing element. Basically, it requires that you have a specific analysis on how you did on your prog programs that were specific to your special needs populations from your last housing element. How was your progress on implementing those programs and were there any gaps? So really just taking an extra look at your special needs population programs from your fifth cycle housing element and seeing where there are any gaps and how you can improve on them in your, new, in your sixth cycle housing element program section. 
Next slide, please. Next slide. So really quick on ADUs, um, this is again rele most relevant to your housing element. AB 671 requires that as part of your housing element, you include an ADU plan, or basically a, a ADU program that incentivizes the creation of ADUs. Next slide, please. So again, originally part of your fifth cycle housing element, you had six program core areas. Now you have a seventh program core area, which is developing a plan that incentivizes and promotes ADUs. That can be um, that can be rented at an affordable rent. Well, basically, when we say develop a plan that incentivizes and promotes ADUs, think about if you have pre-approved ADU plans, prototype plans, ADU incentive programs. Those are all things that can be fall that can fall under number seven, the ADU plan core program area. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. So one thing I want to just touch on really quickly is that as, as part of also the new laws around housing elements, one thing that came in was AB 72 and AB 101, which affected housing element compliance. And really, just how important housing element compliance is going to now be. So authorize HCD to revoke housing element compliance and refer any violations to the Attorney General's office through AB 72. It also authorized HCD to oppose, impose fines on housing elements that were not found in substantial compliance with housing element law. One thing I really, really want to emphasize about this law, AB 72, AB 101, and housing element enforcement, is HCD engages and will continue to engage in a very rigorous TA process before we get to the point of revoking compliance or, um, or, or imposing fines. The reason for that is we understand there's a variety of reasons why you may be having issues around compliance or issues around your housing element in general, and we want to help you address those issues before we get to that place. We want to make sure we're providing you the TA, we're having open conversations about what's going on, finding ways, and also that's the reason why we had a lot of our funding programs um, like SB2 and LEAP grants to help you make sure you're, having, you're compliant with the law and doing things to make, to make sure you're accelerating housing production. Next slide, please. So again, this is just our general approach to enforcement. Really, I just want to focus on, we'll be engaging in a lot of TA before we get to the point of enforcement. And then can we go to the next slide? Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And then really quickly, last thing, two laws that affect your site's inventory but are pretty straightforward is SB6 required that as of January 1st, 2021, each jurisdiction must sub submit an electronic copy of their site's inventory with the adopted housing element. That will be on a form that HCD has, is, has developed and is working on right now. It was a form that was presented as part of the site's inventory webinar on, I think, believe, July 27th, and that is the form that you can use to comply with SB6. Another one is 1486, AB 1486, where it's basically within your site's inventory, you just want to identify which sites are publicly owned sites. And I think I will end my presentation there because I believe we're out of time. Um, again, all of these slides will be available and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about these specific laws. And we'll hold all of our questions until after our next uh, presentation. Um, so at this time, we will have a presentation by Eric DeCock and Helen Campbell from OBR. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, Eric DeCock here, uh, Program Manager for Planning and Community Development at uh, OPR. I hope everyone can see my screen. Can someone just please verify? Yes. Great. Awesome. Yeah, so Eric DeCock, OPR, uh, thanks everyone for having us here today. I want to thank SCAG for the invitation and also HCD uh, for letting us share the stage with you today, our partners here uh, in helping uh, plan California. Um, what I'm going to do is initially uh, go into some overview of uh, various general plan updates for other elements that are sort of triggered by or related to the housing element update. And then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Helen Campbell, who um, is a senior planner on our team and is going to talk to you about our new site check tool, very exciting development uh, to support site selection and infill development uh, in California. So next, uh, I am controlling the slide, so I don't need to say next slide. Um, the 
first slide here on general plan guidelines. So I don't really want to spend a lot of time in general plan 101. I think most of us kind of generally know the gist. But just a quick overview again of what the required elements are. Obviously, the housing element, the only element that's regulated and, and put on a cycle of eight years. Um, obviously, there's been a couple laws that have passed in recent years that we're going to talk about in this presentation that sort of connect and are jumping off points from the next housing element update. And we want to talk about those. Specifically, I've highlighted in red here the safety element and the environmental justice element as well, two very new um, and, and very specific sets of requirements and multiple sets of requirements actually uh, for, in the case of the safety element. But I uh, just want everyone to be thinking about as we're going through the housing element update in the cycle, that many of you for the first time could be on the hook to now do uh, additional updates to your general plan related to safety, environmental justice, in some cases, even other elements related to those requirements. So we wanna talk about that today and just sort of get into the meat of that now. Let's start off with the safety element. So as many of you know, uh, the safety element, there were some new requirements that passed into law about five years ago, requiring that the safety element be updated to address climate vulnerability and adaptation. Um, and the trigger mechanism for this was actually at the next update to a local hazard mitigation plan uh, and that can, went into effect on or after January 1 of 2017 or by January 1 of 2022 if the jurisdiction does not have a local hazard mitigation plan. So what this effectively means is that if you had a hazard mitigation plan basically in the next five years because they must be updated every five years by federal law, uh, you will have updated your safety element by January 1 of 22, regardless of whether you have a local hazard mitigation plan or not. So we're about two years away from seeing a lot of safety element updates get into gear if they haven't already in California. Um, just a quick point of reference as well is that uh, the statute does provide some flexibility. If you already have a climate adaptation plan, you've already done some work on climate change impacts, vulnerability and adaptation, it's okay to incorporate those other plans by reference into the safety element, the key uh, consideration, of course, is that uh, you're going to want to make sure that those separate plans are consistent with the statute uh, as amended by SB 379. Another important law that folks don't talk about as much is the one that's related to the housing element. And this is SB 1035, which passed in 2018. And it added a regular review and update cycle uh, for flooding, fire hazards, and climate adaptation in the safety element. And it says that at a upon the next housing element update and upon and every eight years thereafter, you must take a look at your safety element and make sure that those specific components of the safety element are up to date and are based on the latest information. Uh, so this is something that not a lot of folks have, have had a lot of awareness about, but we just wanted to highlight that today and know that there is sort of a nexus uh, to this housing element update cycle. Each successive cycle will bring this requirement back into play. So just wanna make sure everyone is uh, aware of that. Uh, really quickly, so what is required in the SB 379 climate adaptation analysis? Well, first of all, the main key component is that vulnerability assessment. It's that technical study and maybe some outreach um, and some analysis of the kind of risks that climate change poses to a local agency and, and the geographic areas that are at risk from climate change impacts. Uh, so, you know, obviously climate change doesn't, it does bring on some new challenges, but it basically exacerbates a lot of the existing hazards in your safety elements. So it's a question of, taking a look at climate change, uh, overlaying that on your hazards in, in your, uh, that are addressed in your safety element and thinking about uh, who's vulnerable and how do you respond. Uh, and then of course, uh, goals, policies, and objectives that respond are responsive to the findings of that vulnerability assessment and, and then feasible implementation measures that would carry that out. Uh, we did just release a new adaptation planning guide in California. The final draft was just posted uh, earlier this week by Cal OES. So I want to make sure that folks are aware of that. This is just a nice snapshot of one of the graphics in the plan that talks about sort of the planning process to go about doing uh, a climate adaptation plan. Um, of course, the adaptation planning guide can be used by anyone. It's not just for local governments. It is primarily designed with local governments in mind. And there's a lot of usable information. It's a great roadmap to help to scope out uh, your adaptation updates to your safety element. Okay, the next big safety element item that I wanted to address today was wildfire. I think we're all uh, high, you know, Californians, we're all very aware even today we have over 350 fires burning currently in California today. 10% of those are major wildfire emergencies that Cal Fire and other first responders are actively working on. 
uh, and this isn't going to go away. Uh, and of course, the legislature recognized, even as far back as 2012, that we needed to add very specific mandatory wildfire requirements to the safety element, especially for those jurisdictions in the state responsibility area. Of course, that's the area where CAL FIRE has jurisdiction for fire suppression and prevention. And then the very high fire hazard severity zone, uh, which is a specific subset of all uh, fire hazard severity zones that are mapped. There are moderate, high, and very high, but the very high ones are those that are in local responsibility, lo uh, local responsibility areas per the statute. Uh, so there are about 189 cities and 52 counties in California to which to whom this applies. Um, and the effective date of meeting all the very specific requirements, which we don't have time to get into today, uh, is, a, as you can see here on the screen, upon the next housing element update on or after January 1 of 2014. Now, those requirements went into effect six years ago. Of course, that was already when the last cycle of housing element updates had started. So some jurisdictions, including maybe some folks on the line today, uh, maybe you're in an update uh, time period where that wasn't kicked in last time. So we wanna make sure everyone's aware of that if you didn't get to it the last time around, uh, the next housing element update would now be the time that you would need to look at your wildfire uh, requirements uh, per SB 1241. Just wanted to highlight that OPR is actively working on a new guidance, while not new, it's an updated guidance called the Fire Hazard Planning general plan technical advice series. This is a document that's on the same page as all of our general plan guidelines and all of our technical advisories. Uh, we're required by law to actually update this this year. Um, and we're taking a big focus on land use. Uh, there are some vague requirements in the safety element uh, portion that I just reviewed, but uh, this bill actually asks us to take a look at very specific land use strategies that can be included in the safety element to protect buildings, infrastructure, and communities. Uh, so we are in this update process now. Um, we're thinking about how to best align uh, this new planning guide, this updated planning guidance for wildfire in light of what's in the statute, but also thinking about how best to align a safety element update with your local hazard mitigation plan update, with your community wildfire protection plans, and even, of course, with your SB 379 climate adaptation requirements. So trying to think about giving more holistic and integrated guidance for pulling all these pieces together. Uh, so um, next, next thing to think about for the safety element is evacuation routes. There were two key bills that passed into law in 2019 that add some very specific evacuation route considerations in the safety element. The first one um, is a much broader requirement. This, what's in that first bullet point there is pretty much what's stated in the statute, uh, which is that you must update the safety element to identify evacuation route, routes and evaluate their capacity, safety, and viability under a range of emergency scenarios. So it's fairly broad. Um, the timing of that, interestingly, is tied now to the local hazard mitigation plan, which bears some very similar although reversed timing uh, considerations compared to this uh, adaptation uh, requirements under SB 379. Uh, the other one that is tied to the housing element is SB 99. And under SB 99, you must update the safety element to identify residential developments in hazard areas that do not have at least two emergency evacuation routes, um, sort of ingress, egress uh, points of access. So the timing is uh, now, it's any uh, housing element update on or after January 1 of 2020. So SB 99 is triggered by housing element updates in this cycle and we want folks to be aware of that today. Uh, we will give you a little uh, pointer too that CAL FIRE is in the process of conducting a statewide survey of subdivisions with, without two points of ingress and egress. Uh, that was also part of the AB 2911 that I mentioned earlier on the previous slide. So I just want folks to be aware that uh, CAL FIRE may be a resource in the future. Uh, they are by statute supposed to complete that statewide survey uh, by 2021. Next, I'm gonna focus on environmental justice really quickly. Uh, environmental justice provisions are defined in state law as the fair treatment and the meaningful involvement of all races, cultures, incomes, and national origins with the respect to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Uh, OPR is the lead state agency for the coordination of environmental justice across the suite of state agencies. Uh, that was put into place back in 1999. Uh, we first developed and published environmental justice guidance for planners and for general plans as far back as 2003. Of course, that guidance at the time was, was advisory. Uh, we did not have SB 1000 at the time. So 
SB 1000 passed in 2016 does require all cities and counties who have disadvantaged communities within their jurisdiction to address environmental justice in their general plans. Uh, the statute says it could be a separate and dedicated environmental justice element. It could also be integrated uh, into other general plan elements. You could also take a hybrid approach. There's really no right or wrong way uh, to do that environmental justice work if you're going to, to be doing it. Uh, the timing provision, we get asked about this a lot. It's upon the adoption of revision of two or more elements concurrently on or after January 1 of 2018. So we're a few years into the compliance period now. So if folks are going through uh, an update process could be housing element, could be safety element, land use. It doesn't really matter, but that combination of updating two or more elements concurrently then initiates a, a definite EJ update if you meet the, the criteria, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, I just want everyone to be aware as well that we did release updated environmental justice guidance uh, back in June of this summer. Uh, so that is on our website under general plan guidelines, and it does supersede the prior environmental, just, uh, environmental justice section of the 2017 general plan guidelines. So what must that EJ element do? Well, obviously the first step is to identify who's disadvantaged and who are your disadvantaged community, who has suffered disproportionately from environmental racism, from racial injustice in terms of the way land use decisions, infrastructure, services, exposure to pollution, uh, there's a whole host of things that you should be doing, uh, and that's all stated pretty uh, in detail in our new guidance. Of course, once you've identified disadvantaged communities and those unique burdens being carried by those communities, the goal is to address and reduce the unique or compounded health risks that those communities have, have been experiencing and continue to experience. Uh, under the current situation. And there's a, uh, you know, whether we're talking about re reducing pollution exposure, uh, air quality, that could also be water quality, water pollution, brown fields, that really there is no, um, there's no end to the limit of what you must do, but the statute does specifically talk about air quality. Uh, promoting public facilities, food access, uh, safe and sanitary homes, obviously, uh, given the topic at hand today, we want to make sure folks are thinking about maybe some nexus opportunities between that safe and sanitary homes provision and what you might be thinking about uh, in your housing elements as well. Uh, then last but not least, uh, promoting physical activity. Uh, there's a strong impetus in the bill as well to promote civic engagement and the public decision-making process. Uh, OPR believes that that's a directive to engage with communities both in the EJ element update itself but as well as setting up the general plan to provide meaningful engagement opportunities as the general plan is implemented over its horizon. So a really big shift and a super important focus on uh, stronger efforts on engagement uh, moving forward. And then last but not least, I did wanna highlight that the, the, last, the fourth major provision is to prioritize improvements and programs that address the needs of disadvantaged communities. So I think that you know plans mean nothing unless we're taking them seriously. If we're saying that we need to look at the and address the needs of disadvantaged communities, this also means prioritizing investments, prioritizing improvements, programs that specifically address uh, the needs of disadvantaged community. We're working on equitable solutions, thinking about racial equity and environmental justice as part of this this work. One of the key provisions in SB 1000 that we do get asked a lot about and did spend a lot of time on in our new guidance is trying to unpack the somewhat confusing definition for disadvantaged communities in the bill. And I will say uh, that it's partly technical and it's partly uh, a process that you engage with your community and your stakeholders to, to navigate this pathway. The statute does first start with Envi Cal EnviroScreen. Uh, we don't have time to unpack everything of how that was created. I think a lot of folks know about it, but just know that the Cal Enviro screen method is the first place you start. And that is where census tracts using the state screening methods developed by Cal EPA and OEHA have identified census tracts that have a combined score of 75% or higher in the Cal Enviro screen rating system, which is a, a scale of zero to 100. So uh, those folks in that top 25th percentile are at least considered disadvantaged by SB 535 and by SB 1000. But SB 1000 doesn't just stop at that definition. There are two other ways that uh, disadvantaged communities could also be identified for SB 1000 purposes. And those are income-based definitions where you look at your low-income populations that meet different income thresholds in combination with information about pollution burden and the social determinants of health and disadvantaged um, 
populations that could exist because of income in combination with very specific local conditions. And so that wavy line that you see on the screening diagram here indicates that there's some technical screening, but there's also a process of conversation with the community in combination with looking at the data. And that's where we're really strongly encouraging folks to think through how to engage the community, how do you engage partners who are concerned about environmental justice and looking at the data together and hearing the stories, uh, understanding the conditions that have led to folks being, uh, you know, suffering from disproportionate exposures and dis disproportionate investments over, over the course of history leading up to the present day to really begin to identify who's disadvantaged and why, and then how do you plan for those communities. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip this slide because I know I'm running a bit over time, but I did just want to highlight that um, what I stated earlier is sort of the, the, the language in the statute does talk about unique or compounded health risk. So there's a lot of different ways that that can be identified. I think I spoke to that earlier. And we're really talking about addressing some of the inequities, right? Some of the racially uh, discriminatory practices of planners or other institutions in the past. So we're dealing with systemic racism here. And we're looking at ways to address those dis disproportionate burdens that have exist that exist on the ground and that we need to begin addressing through the planning process. Now I'm going to shift a little bit more to resources before I hand off to Helen, but uh, you know, OPR has been talking with HCD for quite a long time about how do we how do we get at some of these other general plan elements and incentivize folks to think about um, some of these mandatory updates to the safety element, the new environmental justice requirements, is there a way that we can resource this and help to sort of align all of our different planning and housing goals together? So we came up with some integration concepts that I believe the HCD staff around the state have been sending out, which we want to thank HCD for that. But uh, we have created some ancillary guidance that can potentially support folks building scopes of work or um, some projects that link together uh, housing production work, uh, work done for, through perhaps the local early action planning grants, even though the primary purpose is accelerating housing production, what are those other eligible activities that could be funded through the programs like LEAP, where you can also get at some of the other complementary actions that can help to support housing production while also achieving other planning goals, whether we're talking about uh, where to put housing, uh, you know, avoiding the most hazardous portions of the landscape or in a jurisdiction, whether we're looking at those environmental justice issues around affordable, affordable housing, affirmatively furthering fair, fair housing, um, are there, uh, you know, environmental justice or equity decisions that need to be made in combination with some of our work on, on accelerating and supporting fair, uh, fair housing production. So, this guidance is out there. I know it's been distributed by SCAG and others, and I know that HCD has done, done a good job of this, but just want folks to know this is sort of a new short guidance document. It's only maybe four to six pages long, uh, but it does provide some folks some jumping off points to think about how to leverage uh, the current funding that's available today for dealing with some of these additional elements that may need to be updated. Uh, last but not least, I will talk a little bit about AB 2140. Just thinking about those safety element requirements again, uh, there's a strong incentive, if you haven't done it already, to incorporate by reference your local hazard mitigation plan into your safety element. It does provide you eligibility for pre-disaster mitigation funding under the California Disaster Assistance Act. So a huge incentive, uh, if you haven't already, in your next local hazard mitigation update to make sure that's incorporated by reference. Uh, once again, because there is such a huge funding opportunity here, we just want, don't, want folks, uh, don't want folks to miss out on the opportunity for aligning all these different safety elements updates with the local hazard get, mitigation plan update and then to think about how to fund implementation over the long term uh, to make your uh, community disaster ready. We do have uh, sample case studies and policies that are available for review as well that accompanies the new EJ guidance. So we wanna make folks make sure folks are aware that that's on our website. Uh, and I'm running a bit out of time. So I'm just gonna let you look at these links when you get the, uh, you look at these resources when the presentation is sent around uh, afterwards today and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll be available for Q and A afterwards and I'm gonna hand it over to Helen Campbell, my colleague to talk about site check.
Hi, Eric. Thank you so much for that presentation. I know we're running short on time, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive in. My name is Helen Campbell. I'm with OPR. I'm the senior planner there, focused on a lot of land use and housing issues. I'm here to talk about the new tool that we developed um, called SiteCheck, which actually just debuted today. Um, it was password protected up, up until today. So next slide, please, Eric. Thanks. So SiteCheck is basically a mapping and analysis tool that was funded by HCD uh, through the planning grants program from SB2, which is the Building Homes and Jobs Act. Um, the uh, website itself, the tool can be um, linked to at the following website. So sitecheck.opr.ca.gov. If you guys go on to that link right now, this will be the first time you can see it without a password, but the password was included there in case that wasn't going to debut um, today. The tool was developed by OPR and uh, the Conservation Biology Institute. It, uh, the purpose of it is to accelerate the production of housing by facilitating planning decisions and clarifying where existing streamlining options exist uh, under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, it does not, it cannot be used for CEQA determinations, but it does help you see all in one place where the location requirements for some CEQA exemptions um, exist. So uh, we also um, worked with Urban Footprint and Ascent uh, to develop um, some data sets and to develop practitioner toolkits. We also worked with MPOs and COGS across the state to gather some data that is featured in the tool. And we thank SCAG for participating in the focus group um, that led to some important feedback for developing SiteCheck. Go ahead, next slide. So uh, this version of SiteCheck that we just debuted is considered the beta version. Um, we are open to your feedback. If you go into the first page of the tool, uh, there's a little button for feedback, but this is um, basically the first version. We expect the full version to be launched sometime in early 2021 when we receive additional funding to build out the other portions of the tool. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the feedback form that we welcome your input on. Next slide. So just to begin, SiteCheck is a screen, has a screening function. So all of the parcels in the state of California are loaded onto this tool. And as you decide to look for things according to certain criteria, such as whether it's in an urbanized area as defined in PRC 21071, or if it's covered by a specific plan, if it's within half a mile of a major transit stop, the parcels start becoming reduced. They start going away from the screen um, if they don't meet that criteria. So it's a little bit, you'll see here, this is the area around USC and uh, Exposition Park and the LA football um, stadium. Next slide. The tool also offers um, a heat map or a concentration of CEQA exemptions. So you'll notice the purple areas here are where the CEQA exemptions in this area are concentrated. You'll notice that the, the campuses, USC campus and Exposition Park itself, don't have CEQA exemptions. They're already developed. Um, next slide. Uh, if you go into the layers function of site check, um, you'll notice you can screen, you can um, visualize a lot of the existing major transit stops, high quality transit corridors. Um, all of these data sets, if it has a blue button next to it, you can click on that blue button. It takes you to a website called databasein and uh, they're fully downloadable as shapefiles and as GIS um, layer packages so that you can pop them into your own GIS at home and do further analysis. So this is also the first time we've organized a lot of major transit and SQL related data sets for the state and they're fully downloadable for you. Next slide. So another um, important function of the layers is that you can also look at things according to environmental constraints. So in this area here, I um, clicked on the special habitats and if there were any floodplains in the area, which is located in um, along the 110 freeway over here, you're also allowed to make the layers a little bit more or less transparent. Um, and so the tool will indicate to you whether these hazards or special habitat areas exist around the area that you're looking to develop. Next slide. 
So once you go into, you know, you've already screened out, looked for certain parcels that meet your criteria, you've um, kind of understood, you know, I want to locate my site next to a transit stop or next to a high quality transit corridor, and you've sort of screened those things out in, under screen and layers, you go into the analyze function of the tool and you start to go in and select a parcel um, to develop a, a little bit of a deeper dive on um, what SQL exemptions and streamlining options exist for that parcel. So as you can see here, I went ahead that area, the little um, parcel that's highlighted in blue is the area that I selected. It's across the street from the LA football stadium. Um, it is, uh, you know, doesn't, it, it was along a high quality transit corridor and it doesn't, it's not in any special habitat area. So I went ahead and selected that. Next slide. You'll notice that once you click on the slide, you have a, um, a street view function that can pop up in Google Earth. So we integrated a, a version of street view into SiteCheck so you can take a look of what that parcel looks like, not in real time, but according to whenever Google passed by and, and took a picture of it. So you'll see that this parcel is a, currently a parking lot. Um, so, you know, maybe that's something that is a little bit easier to develop for a lot of people. It's across the street from a major stadium. Um, so maybe, you know, you could also uh, look at that, at what the parcel is like by changing the base layer in, in Site Check. You can go into aerial imagery or other types of base layers to make it more easier to understand what, what site, what is underneath the site that you would like to develop. Next slide. So uh, the SQL provisions that are included in the tool include 13 provisions that are all housing related. So we've included this, these statutory exemptions. Um, the categorical, the categorical exemptions and these streamlining options. So the tool goes in and kind of makes an assessment of whether or not the parcel meets those location criteria. Next slide. Then you're able to download a report. So the report is really, I know this is a sort of a dense slide, but I'm just gonna go over it pretty quickly. Um, if you, if your parcel, it has a check mark located next to it. It means that the tool, um, that your parcel met all of the spatial requirements for that SQL provision. If it's a question mark, it means that the spatial requirements may have been met, but that the user must determine um, some further requirements or that there are no spatial requirements um, associated with that parcel. An X means that your parcel did not meet the CEQA spatial uh, requirements in order to receive those exemptions. So you'll notice in the report, you have the little parcel gets highlighted with the APN and address num uh, the address and the APN number, and you can start to scroll down and look at all of the statutory, categorical, and streamlining options um, that it qualifies for. When you click on download the report, you can download either all exemptions. <laughs> Someone just crashed the website. Oh, that's exciting. Um, with only check marks, with check marks and only uh, question marks. And um, when you download the report, this parcel in particular um, uh, was, it created a 26 page report. And um, it basically, this is the section of the report where, you know, it met one of the spatial requirements, which, which was it was in a low vehicle travel area. So we did include um, the below VM the below VMT um, areas on this tool that met the state travel demand model. So even though it's not a layer that you can see, the report does check to see if it's in a below um, regional average VMT layer. Um, and it also kind of indicates to you what the user needs to determine in order to meet those SQL requirements. So for instance, in this example, the user still needs to determine the type of housing that's gonna be located on the parcel, whether it's residential or mixed use. Um, the infill capacity, if it adjoins, uh, you know, or if it's separated by only public rights of way or not, if it's SCS consistent, if it needs soil and water remediation. So there's a, a whole set of things that the user needs to still determine, but at least SiteCheck gets you part of the way there by get, giving you all of that locational mapping sort of um, requirements out of your way. Next slide. Um, we also included a section on site check with um, that's called other resources. So there are other housing related SQL exemptions that don't necessarily have spatial requirements, 
but that the user should pay attention to and perhaps could look into further to see if their parcel meets those requirements. Those are all, those um, SQL provisions are all listed in other resources. Um, we also worked with our partner um, in Ascent Environmental to develop a set of practitioner toolkits for how to apply for um, a statutory exemption and how to apply for a categorical exemption. It walks you through the steps of like of filing a notice of exemption and it gives you kind of an overview on all of the codes that go into um, that exemption. Next slide. You can also share your work by clicking on create link. This link allows you to post this, save it for, for later. Um, as far as we know, uh, there's no time frame for how long it could be saved. So you could theoretically save your work onto a little uh, digital word pad and go back to it months later when you're ready to, you know, as you develop the project. Next slide. Helen, we have just one minute left. Okay. Well, what's next? We have the beta launch, which just, it launched today. Uh, we're gonna be um, talking more about this tool at our OPR webinar Wednesdays, which you're able to sign up for via our OPR announcements. Um, next week, we won't be talking about SiteCheck on our YouTube channel, but we normally have all of our Webinar Wednesday um, presentations on our YouTube channel. That, that is a hyperlink you can click on. We are going to include um, some statewide big data VMT layers. Uh, those will hopefully be developed by September and will be available on OPR's SB 743 website. Um, and like I mentioned, we are going to launch 1.0, hopefully in winter 2021. Those could include a whole bunch of things, including any statutory changes that happened this year. Um, and we could also incorporate housing funding streams with location requirements. Next slide. This is what's really next. We hope all of your infill parcels are as happy as this dog getting hugged by your urban area, which is a raccoon. Next slide. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Helen. So we do have time for a few questions. Um, we have a site check question. Does the parcel parcel feature, sorry, I just got an email that covered the question. Does the parcel feature refer to a specific tax rule parcel year and how often is this layer updated? So the layers for uh, the parcels are updated on a yearly basis. Um, we pay for this parcel data set through a big contract at the state. And while um, the provider has updates that are available even up to a daily basis, for this beta version of the tool, we're only gonna update the parcel information once a year. Thank you. And um, we also have a couple questions for HCD. Um, this question actually came through our email, our housing email. How is HCD dealing with short-term rentals? Uh, can short-term rentals be considered a form of losing units for housing? And um, how can we address these issues in our housing elements? Sure, I'll let Paul McDougall take care of that one. Thank you, Sohab. Um, so uh, Sohab mentioned that there's a um, specific analysis around uh, um, non-governmental constraints uh, more governmental constraints, and so uh, if there are policies for short-term short rentals, um, those uh, should and could be evaluated, and then um, appropriate policies and programs. So uh, um, there's a little bit of flexibility in how you go about that and, and uh, um, how the, uh, um, the jurisdictions wants to address that, and certainly impacts on, on housing uh, could be evaluated. And we also, if you're in the coastal zone, uh, um, encourage folks to try to harmonize uh, um, the objectives of housing as well as our coastal resources. Thank you. Um, one more question. Given the large arena allotment, how will HCD interpret a AFFH rules and um, if a built out community has no choice but to concentrate its arena allotment? I think I handled that one in the, um, the chat. Okay. Awesome. Are there any other questions? You can enter your questions in the chat if you um, have any other questions. Let's see. Um, this presentation, all of the presentations will be provided following the event and um, as well as the recording of the event. So you missed anything, uh, you can always look back at it. And I will pass it back to Mayan. Great, 
Thanks, Alicia. Um, well, we are a little early, um, but uh, it's always good to take advantage of being early so you can catch up on emails. Uh, so we've reached to the point in the agenda where we have a break. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, that was a great panel. Um, and thank you, Alicia, and all our panelists today. Please give them a round of applause. Um, there's always that little uh, reaction function I always like to use. Uh, all right. So. Um, uh, we'll, I'll review, uh, we'll review all of the questions today and post them at the workshop um, and also all workshop presentations and this recording will be posted as well. Uh, so right now uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll come back at 2.30. So I'm sure you have emails piling up and maybe even the second half of your lunch to eat. Uh, but feel free if you do have questions again, you can email housing at skag.ca.gov or you can also put them in the chat box. So uh, we'll see you back here at 2.30. It looks like, uh, hey, my honor, it'd be great if we could take the mute function off everybody, just see what happens. Okay. Uh, well, we do have some time, so uh, yeah, let's give it a five minutes uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, I think okay. if you're on the phone, you can also unmute by okay, pressing. Okay, I can do that. Um, nice. And then I'll, and then, so I, I will have some I heavy did that for healing, right? I, I think I read, like, if it's more than... Uh, that was a bad experiment. Um, yeah. I don't think everyone realizes they are unmuted. So yeah. how about um, if we can mute everyone again, uh, AV staff, if you're able to do that. <laughs> More if you have a question, how about this? If you have a question, let's do the raise hand function. Um, I think you can find that. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, I think we disable uh, under the participants list. Ah, yes, um, under the participants uh, list. Thank you. Uh, so, if you can raise your hand, um, and Alicia, if you want to take questions. Uh... It looks like there's one on three thirty. Um, I'll try to handle it quickly because there's a little bit of construction going on in my house, but. Uh, um, so SB 330, one piece of SB 330 is the Housing Crisis Act, and there's kind of a suspension or void of, of um, certain things related to housing, like, uh, um, you know, policies that result in less intensification, moratorium, scope controls, and what have you. And there's also um, kind of a suspension or void of uh, um, our, our, where cities or localities, affected localities, um, cannot... Uh, um, approve housing developments that uh, demolish units unless they're replaced. And so um, there's two there's two kind of categories of that. One is replacement of just simply units, and then there's other kind of group called protected units. So those are things with affordability terms and what have you. And so this person is asking, with the re replacement requirements, is there any kind of equivalency test? Or, you know, in other words, if you were to demolish permanent supportive housing or demolished affordable homes and should whatever replaces that be equivalent in some way. And, uh, um, and I believe it, it really depends. I mean, I'd have to look back at it in more detail. We can have a conversation offline. Um, but there's a little bit of, um, I have some questions in the statute where um, if it's just a regular unit, no, there isn't anything related to the equivalency, but if it's a protected unit, um, there's in the definition that it, it talks about equivalency, but then you don't see that in the provision, so it's a little bit messy. But I think when you go to the um, same similar provisions in, in density bonus law, it does kind of start to speak to the kind of the, that comparable unit or that equivalency uh, factor. Just to answer. Uh, Alicia, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> uh, we have one hand raised, Barbara Broyd. Oh, hi. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. One had to do with the updating of the site check related to transit because we're seeing so many modifications in routes and frequency of transit in light of COVID travel changes. So I'm just wondering if the site will only update on each of the things once a year of transit will be more frequent. The other question is not really, it's related to this having to do with severe fire hazard zones. Many of the bills currently being um, considered in the legislature ignore the severe fire hazard zones when they are increasing requirements for density and doing so in areas that don't have proper evacuation 
capability. Is there anything in the existing uh, legislation or guidelines that would stop that from happening? I could take um, the site check question. So I did answer that in the chat, Barbara, oh, but sorry, just so everybody hears, it's okay. Um, a lot of people are just calling in. Um, so the transit data for now in the beta version, all data sets are just um, planned to be updated once a year. Once we acquire funding and build out the rest of the tool um, for 1.0, we do, there is a possibility for transit data to be updated on a daily basis using what's called GTFS data. This is the same data that you know, your phone um, allows you to, to look at when you're kind of deciding to, to basically map out a route on Google Maps or on Safari. So it takes G these, these um, companies take, you know, GTFS data, it uploads on, a, on a almost hourly basis. So we hope to create a data set for at least transit given all of these impacts and changes, um, these COVID related changes. And, and the date of the current transit data was gathered when? The current transit data was, was gathered from January through April of uh, 2020. Okay, we have one more question. Um, this user does not have a name. Uh, I think maybe me and Eric could address the second part of that question if you want to kick it off, Eric. Yeah, there was another question about the fire hazard severity zones in the, the extreme or severe areas. So, Barbara, good question. Um, so, the, you know, the, the general plan and all the implementing mechanisms in the general plan, all the elements must be internally consistent. So. If your community has identified very high fire hazard severity zones, extreme fire threat areas, and you have policies in your safety element that restrict development or place a lot of conditions to ensure safety, uh, those conditions must be complied with regardless of new statutes for housing production as well. So we need to have, the general, the general plan does need to be internally consistent. Um, so that's something to consider as just a starting point. So we wanna make sure that folks are thinking about this as they're going about the current cycle, looking at these allocations, you know, you've got, you're looking at suitable sites, you're looking at the, all the constraints that may apply. And some of that may, you, need, you may need to look in your safety element or other mechanisms that are there. Um, I think we're in compliance. The problem is that newly proposed laws would make it possible to override those. Right. Well, and that's a, you know, that each situation I will say is very, you know, each jurisdiction has unique conditions as well. So it's really hard to say you may, you may be in compliance with certain regulations, but there could be other situations where uh, I, I think of what Barbara's getting at is, you know, is one trump another, and that's really hard to say. Um, so I just want to put that out there, but Paul, you may have more to add. Thank you. Okay, there's one more question. Uh, the user has the uh, last four digits, 2637. Hi, this is uh, Lucy. I'm with the city of um, Los Angeles, and I had that SB 330 question. And the reason I ask it is because we have um, a lot of older housing stock in multifamily and commercial zones. And the SB 30, 330 requirement, as we interpret it, requires that if you have, say, a single family home on a project, that you have to replace it by number of bedrooms. But we have permanent supportive housing, senior affordable and veterans housing, where single occupancy tenancy is the preferred tenancy to promote independent living. And the provision of a, a three bedroom replacement is cost prohibitive. But we also don't want to deny a 100% affordable project, um, even if it's providing studios and one bedrooms and can't provide the three bedroom unit. And I wanted to understand if there was any flexibility for the city to make some policies that would preclude replacement requirements if the project was providing, say, 100% affordable or was catering to a specific type of um, constituency, such as senior housing or veterans homeless housing or, or something to that effect. Um, because we don't want to deny the project by virtue of it not complying with the replacement, the equivalency replacement provisions. Yeah, I mean, we're glad to explore that with you. I mean, we can take it offline and, and we can talk to our legal and see if there's any ways we can navigate those objectives. So just feel free to contact. 
Great, great, thank you. All right, great. Um, well, these are really great questions. And if you do have any uh, other questions, uh, feel free to email housing at scag.ca.gov, um, or you can also email the panelists directly. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, then uh, go into a quick 10 minute break. I'm um, sure you have emails or happy lunches you need to attend to. Uh, so feel free to uh, take a break and uh, let's convene here back at, uh, two, well, we'll make it an even number. Um, we'll just uh, convene back at 2.35. Um, that way I'll just give you a few minutes to catch up on things. So we'll that's, see an, that's an odd number. Uh, I know it is. <laughs> It definitely is. Uh, so uh, let's meet back here at 2.35. Awesome. I would encourage our afternoon speakers to stay on and keep their spot. <laughs> um, if we have any afternoon speakers, please just maybe um, mute your computer or something. Hey, my aunt, let's try the unmute thing again. That was awesome. Dang you, Paul. All right, well, it's now 2.35. Uh, hopefully you were able to answer some emails, get some coffee and get some hot air. Uh, so let's get started with panel two, uh, SCAG and HCD technical assistance moderated by Lyle Janicek, Associate Regional Planner at SCAG. 
Lyle? Thank you, Mayan. And uh, like uh, Mayan said, I hope everybody got some, a chance to grab some coffee, maybe do some jumping jacks. It's that time of the afternoon where folks get a little bit tired. But we've got a great panelist up uh, coming up right now. Um, our last panel of the day is SCAG and HCD Technical Assistance. We'll discuss the tools and resources available to assist your jurisdiction with sixth cycle of housing element updates, implementing housing topics, and building public support for housing decisions. We have some great panelists in this session, including Kevin Kane, who's a program manager and demographer for SCAG, uh, Sohab Mehmood, uh, housing policy specialist from California Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as Paul McDougall uh, from housing and policy manager uh, at HCD. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, I'll just give you forewarning. I'll give you a two minute uh, left uh, warning and then I'll let you know when uh, it's time to wrap up. Go ahead, Kevin. Great, thanks Lyle, appreciate it. Let me know if people can't hear me, see my screen, what have you as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share mine here uh, and uh, start the, uh, the presentation uh, that I've got prepared on technical assistance for housing element updates coming from SCAG. Uh, I do need to uh, give uh, we need to give uh, sufficient credit to uh, all of uh, all of the collaborators uh, on this work uh, who come from a pretty wide range of uh, expertise at SCAG, uh, including uh, uh, Tom Poe, Meg Healy, uh, Junk Sayo, addition to, to uh, Lyle, yourself, uh, and, and others uh, who have uh, been working to put this stuff together in fairly short order, uh, given, uh, uh, given housing element updates. So uh, first I wanna go into a little bit of SCAG's objectives in, in putting some of this material uh, together before I go a little bit more deeply uh, into what it is. The sense that we're getting from local jurisdictions is, uh, maybe this is a little off the cuff, but I'm summarizing here, yikes, my housing element update is due in just over a year. Uh, there are a lot of new laws coming down from Sacramento. Some of them even contributed uh, to uh, having a really huge RENA number this time around. Uh, so that that's, uh, encapsulates a little bit of, uh, of, of what uh, we're hearing from a number of local jurisdictions. Uh, SCAG has a fairly sophisticated data operation. Uh, a lot of folks uh, on this meeting, I'm sure, uh, have been a part of it uh, from some time through local input processes, technical working groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, so our history of local outreach and, and regional planning uh, puts us in fairly good position uh, to provide uh, a little bit of, of support to the extent that we can uh, help out uh, during this process. We also know that the clock for effective uh, TA is, is ticking uh, to some extent. Um, you know, the housing element update is due in less than 14 months. Uh, we did a little bit of a pre-workshop survey here. Uh, I think there were about 100 respondents or so, so thank you uh, to the participants for that. 52% uh, indicated that staff or consultant work was already underway on the housing element update. Uh, so uh, we don't want to be providing something you know, halfway through a process uh, when it doesn't really have uh, uh, quite as much uh, value to, uh, to our members here. Uh, so because of this, we opted not to do uh, a whole uh, large new procurement or program. Uh, just for context, when we start each regional plan, it takes us about 18 months to do comprehensive outreach to all 197 uh, local jurisdictions here. Uh, so our objectives on this are perhaps a little bit more narrow and a little bit more tailored for efficiency. Uh, our objectives are to update, refine, curate, and make existing data sets that we have uh, available uh, and kind of comprehensible uh, as much as possible. Uh, hopefully this will result in, in some time savings. Uh, and uh, we're happy to uh, do some of this work uh, in conjunction with HCD. Uh, Paul and Sohab uh, and, and, uh, and others there in particular, uh, not only to uh, help smooth the review process, but also to think about some kind of safe harbors. For example, using this data set or this approach uh, is, 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 going to, is going to make it a lot easier to demonstrate such and such a factor that you may have uh, heard in one of the last presentations. So uh, that's, that's work in progress. Uh, and this is a bit of an update, but there are a few, uh, a few important uh, uh, nice things, uh, hopefully uh, to be able to get out of here. You know, ultimately, the housing element update is, is a jurisdiction's uh, responsibility to complete, HCD's responsibility to evaluate. But, but that, that being said, uh, definitely happy to uh, develop some tools uh, to help out here. So this is a flyer that we put up on uh, SCAG's housing website, the URL uh, down there at the bottom uh, for some of the technical assistance uh, and some updated timelines. Apologies uh, on some of this being a little bit later uh, than originally anticipated. Um, the first major product, and this, uh, this is more of a presentation outline here, uh, is what we're calling pre-certified local housing data, uh, basically uh, curated data and a report for each local jurisdiction. Uh, actually, yesterday we received a preliminary uh, approval from HCD uh, on this. Uh, we're expecting an official letter probably next week, uh, uh, but this is, uh, this is an anticipated uh, deadline, and, and, and certainly uh, in a post-workshop email, and if you're on our, our housing mailing list, uh, we'll, we'll send a blast out to notify uh, you of the availability of, of this product. 
I'm going to do a little bit of a, a demo of the current SCAG open data portal, uh, the SCAG GIS open data portal. And, and the purpose for that is really going to be to do a, a preview uh, of what we're working to develop by, uh, by late in the fall. Uh, we're anticipating being able to deploy this uh, right around December 1st. Uh, and what this is going to be is a data update and a web application to support site inventories. Uh, basically, we're doing a few things. We're updating uh, parcel level land use data uh, that, that SCAG maintains uh, for 2019 with new uh, information, mostly from county assessors, building footprints, some other things like that. We're adding additional housing specific attributes and analyses, uh, hopefully to, uh, to link more and more closely with some of the uh, site inventory guidelines that HCD provides uh, and to deploy this in a web mapping application. And I got to say, Helen uh, from, from uh, Helen Campbell from OPR, uh, I, I, I hope we, looking at uh, our, uh, what we're trying to put together alongside uh, what SiteCheck provides uh, actually does uh, quite a good job. I think they can be really, really complementary in, uh, in analyzing characteristics uh, of sites across a pretty wide range of local jurisdictions here. Uh, we do have some ADU affordability uh, analyses, uh, but my colleague Meg Hubie will be covering that uh, next week uh, in a presentation along with HCD again too. So here's just a, a cover, uh, a sneak peek of what this, uh, this report will look like. Again, uh, preliminary approval, they're all, they're all generated, uh, but we should be able to, uh, to post these in, in fairly short order. This is the housing needs section uh, of the, uh, the element update. We uh, elected not to use the term housing needs because uh, there is a four letter word uh, that has housing needs right in the middle of it, uh, the arena, and uh, just, to, just to distinguish it a little bit uh, from that process. So, uh, you know, as, as you know, statute requires a quantification and analysis of, of uh, housing needs. This is just a screenshot of uh, HCD's uh, building blocks tool where these are, are laid out in, in really great detail. Uh, another resource for it. Uh, and the right here are, uh, this is how we, we, uh, we organized it into eight major categories, population, employment, and households, uh, section on specialized housing needs, homelessness, disability, housing stock, overpayment, uh, assisted units. Uh, and then finally, the uh, regional housing needs allocation uh, for that local jurisdiction. You know, most of these data sources, but not all of them, uh, are, are pretty uh, straightforward to put together using uh, large scale and regionally available public data sources, such as the American Community Survey, information from the State Department of Finance, uh, Federal HUD, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we've augmented that in a few instances. There are probably a couple of items uh, that are uh, going to need to be augmented by local sources, for example, farm worker housing, if that's applicable in your jurisdiction, some elements of substandard housing quality. Uh, but by and large, I would say 90, 95% uh, of the stuff is there. And what we've generated uh, is a, as a report, including 34 tables and figures. You see a few examples here. I took the liberty of taking the city of Arcadia. So hello, Arcadia, uh, if, if you are on the line. Uh, uh, it's, it's an A, so it's one of the first ones we grab when we put things like this together, Atalanta being the other, the other common one. Uh, we were able to uh, put a little bit of dynamic text and description, uh, some comparisons with regional statistics as appropriate. Uh, like I mentioned, in some instances, it may be necessary to augment this with some local data sources. Uh, for example, as I understand, there are some more specific requirements about homelessness counts uh, and, and in, our, our, uh, in our regional assessment. These are missing in a few jurisdictions in, in Riverside and Imperial counties uh, in particular. We are certainly gonna make the raw data available. Uh, so if you don't like our, uh, the formatting or uh, if you would like to do a deeper dive in, in crafting uh, a, a more relevant local narrative on that, feel free, that's, uh, that's uh, certainly possible. But uh, the intent of putting this together is that uh, if you, if you uh, don't need to do that, uh, save yourself some time uh, and use what we've got here. And like I said, this report will be uh, pre-certified by HCD for use. Uh, I'm including here just, just for reference, and this will be posted, and uh, if you're eager to start on this this afternoon, uh, feel free to take a screenshot of this right here. This is a list of all of the, uh, the specific tables and figures that are included in this uh, data package. Again, these are all jurisdiction level data, so this isn't uh, in any sense drilling down into neighborhood or census tract level to understand, for example, um, you know, the distribution of, of, of resources or affordability or anything like that within a jurisdiction. Uh, just at the jurisdictional level with some comparisons to, to region numbers too. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the, the lowdown on the, uh, um, uh, the local housing data that we're providing. Uh, if you are familiar with SCAG's local profiles, uh, it's a fairly similar uh, kind of a data package and delivery, uh, but the intent is to, to curate it so it specifically matches uh, what's, uh, what's in the uh, housing needs section of the element update and all the statute behind that. 
So the next thing I wanted to dive into um, is talking a little bit about the Skag GIS Open Data Portal. Uh, you, know, you saw with uh, with SiteCheck uh, a, a great uh, GIS uh, uh, tool to to look at, at site specific information. Uh, I think uh, Eric from OPR also referenced Cal and Viro screen. There are other viewers uh, like that, that that do allow you to to get a fairly good sense of of geography, whether it's at the neighborhood level or down to the parcel level. Um, but I wanted to dive into this for a moment because what we're developing in-house here is a fairly basic, fairly straightforward site inventory support uh, web mapping application. Uh, it's not going to be uh, terribly sophisticated, uh, but and it is going to be based on a lot of data for which at least a version of it is currently available. We're, we're working on some updates. Uh, if you're if you um, if you're kind of a Skag watcher, Skag follower, you may see that. Um, uh, that that we're, uh, we're we're hoping to to finalize the 2020 RTP SCS or Connect SoCal very soon. Uh, so so that's another milestone for making uh, some more data updates available. Uh, but the tool uh, that we are developing here has a lot of similarities in terms of the data and features with what's on there on this uh, current Skag GIS Open Data Portal. Uh, like I had mentioned, our target is to make this available in December 1st, and I'll give you a little bit of a preview of what's online now. So. Uh, you know, SCAG does not have land use authority, uh, certainly within a local jurisdiction, that's the purview of the local jurisdiction. But in the course of regional planning, we do need to be able to forecast, to assess, uh, and to craft regional plans to hit a, a real wide variety of targets. And for the last three quadrennial planning cycles, uh, and in some form since, as I understand, at least the early 90s, uh, SCAG has developed parcel level land use data for the entire region for these purposes, uh, with a pretty, uh, pretty rich detailed set of attributes that do get reviewed by local jurisdictions, augmented with uh, local uh, tax assessor information at, at various points through that quadrennial cycle. And we do make the most recent updates to this available online uh, as, as basically what we call the research version. And this is uh, uh, six county shape files or layers or geodatabases, whatever you want to call spatial data, uh, six of those uh, that are up online uh, that have gone through uh, this, uh, this fairly rigorous local review process and augmentation uh, with some other data sources. So uh, there are really four core elements to this parcel level land use data set that we have. The first is the uh, existing land use and we have a code system in order to standardize that across the region. So it may, it may not match uh, necessarily with, uh, with what exists uh, in, in your local data sets necessarily. Here's just a screenshot of a few of the codes here, 1110, single family residential. Uh, it gets down to a little bit more detail too, for example. We also have two versions each of the next three, zone land use, general plan land use, and if applicable, specific plan land use. First, uh, in the SCAG standardized codes, but also we maintain the native jur uh, local jurisdiction uh, codes as well. So uh, for example, if you're looking at this regionally, it might be more appropriate to kind of look at the standardized SCAG codes and map them. But if you're uh, interested in just uh, looking at it locally, uh, this will have uh, at least the most recent update that we received from the local jurisdiction. Again, uh, a comprehensive outreach process uh, is, is a very time consuming task on our end. So I would really, really heavily advise you, uh, any users of this to always note the version, always note the update dates uh, to see uh, exactly what it is. Uh, and, and of course, for official purposes to uh, contact the, the, the local authority directly, which is, is, is most of you uh, certainly on the line here. Uh, we're going. To, we're building some expanded technical assistance right now on top of these layers. First of all, uh, uh, to make it a, a little bit uh, less clunky, uh, so that you don't have to uh, look at everything uh, at a county level, so that they can be looked at at a jurisdictional level. Uh, secondly, we're using county tax assessor data. Uh, sometimes tricky, but but quite crucial, uh, especially as we look to uh, starting uh, the next regional plan. Uh, we'd like to see uh, what's happened uh, since the 2016 effective year of this current plan until. Uh, until, uh, you know, the current date and, and, and going forward. And we're also adding several attributes related to the housing element guidelines, uh, which I'll go into uh, in detail a little bit more. And uh, just to illustrate the data nerdiness of us ourselves, this is what a lot of us use as a headshot. We also host uh, a, a number of other data sets related to our regional planning efforts and external data sets for which we commonly uh, receive requests, which can in some instances be used to uh, to demonstrate a lot of the kind of locational characteristics and, um, uh, and, and things like that that are, that are relevant for housing element and other, other plan updates. Uh, some of these things include our, prior, our most recent priority growth areas for the current year and for uh, the, the plan horizon year, 2045 is what we're, uh, we're on right now. Things like high quality transit areas, transit priority areas and job centers. 
Uh, we also have a series of absolute and variable constraint areas based on uh, a variety of standards. Uh, and we also catch in the environmental justice, uh, disadvantaged community type areas. Uh, those are largely external sources, Calen virus being probably uh, the, uh, uh, the, the provider of a lot of those, a lot of those standards. Um, and in addition, uh, you know, one tool that is probably going to uh, definitely come up uh, in, in some of HCD's uh, discussion, and, and it certainly already has made an appearance in the sites inventory guidebook that they issued uh, back in June, uh, are the opportunity indices from the State Tax Credit Allocation Committee, or TCAC, uh, opportunity data. That's, um, that's a, a really great way, certainly, to just kind of understand the, the higher or lower resourced areas uh, within a jurisdiction, uh, rather than just the housing needs data, which is uh, across or between jurisdictions. We'll also have some other um, fire risk, flood zone, protected natural area uh, type of data. Uh, some of that is available certainly in Enviro Screen site. Check these other tools uh, as well. Now I'm going to go into uh, oh, just a really quick little demo here. And this, uh, I checked my bandwidth. This should be sufficient to, to go through. And I included uh, in the slide deck just a little bit of a step by step of what I plan to show here. Uh, in case you want to take a look at it yourself uh, or, or whatever. I know sometimes that's a frustration of mine uh, to be seeing a demo and, 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 then, uh, and then to not be able to refer back to it later. Uh, so this is the URL here uh, for our op uh, GIS open data portal. And you can see we don't have a, uh, we don't have a massive amount of data here, to be fair. Uh, our planning stuff, uh, plus a lot of commonly requested other things that we rely upon. Uh, for example, if you go to planning data, uh, you can see our, let's just say, high quality transit areas, uh, 2045 for the Skag region. And like I said, be particularly uh, cognizant uh, when using this of the update date. Uh, so these are, are oftentimes uh, living documents uh, uh, that, are, that are being, uh, you know, kind of updated and vetted as we speak. So this is the June 19, 2019 update. Uh, once we have a little bit more uh, certainty perhaps on, on the finalization of a regional plan, something like this might, might get updated. Next, I want to draw your attention to really the core here, this parcel level land use data, uh, which is under the land use category. And what we have here uh, for each county are a general plan land use and a land use combined file. And I'm just going to focus on the land use combined Imperial County file because that's our smallest county and that's the most amenable to a web demo as a result. Uh, and, and keep in mind too, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have the metadata information. This is the November 2018 update uh, with the 2016 uh, effective year data. Uh, following the local review process for uh, the 2020 RTP SCS. And here you can see a list of the attributes. Uh, you can see that again in the metadata, always, uh, always important to look at that where we, we have uh, a lot of our uh, land use code system. I wanna draw your attention also to the download functionality. Uh, we're cognizant certainly that there are a lot of ways uh, that, uh, that housing element updates and that site information uh, is going to be interacted with. And um, you know, one op option certainly always uh, is literally just to use it as a tabular data file to match an APN and to look at whatever characteristic uh, that we're interested in, perhaps size, location, score, public ownership, improvements, land value ratio, some of these types of things would certainly be available uh, in this format as well. Uh, a shape file can link this into your desktop uh, GIS as well. And if you're, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're a little bit fancier, uh, if you've got uh, maybe a, a build such as maybe like an ArcGIS Urban, uh, or an urban footprint or something like that. Uh, th these data can always be plugged into that with, with an API uh, using these addresses here. So what I want to do really quickly is just, uh, just demonstrate a quick little web map of uh, land use here in, uh, in Imperial County. And I'm just going to uh, take a quick look at um, existing land use as of 2016. Again, this is the uh, post local review update, the 20, uh, November 2018 effective time period. Uh, and you can see even at the county level, it's, uh, I think it's reasonably, well, I'd say maybe moderate speed in loading, uh, all things considered. Uh, and uh, in these uh, handy little Esri powered platforms, you can also add um, other things. For example, I was searching before for the uh, SB535 disadvantaged communities. This, this is the version that uh, the SCAG GIS administrator has posted. So I'm going to add that really quickly. And I'm also going to add 2045 SCAG high quality transit areas. Uh, just to take a look at kind of how workflow uh, might look for that. Um, and just to get a sense, th these are the high quality transit areas across the region kind of clustered mostly around uh, Los Angeles. A lot of, uh, uh, you can see rail stations and arterial bus routes and, and things like that. 
Uh, I'm going to zoom over here to uh, Imperial County where I have land use data on top. And uh, you know, one of the advantages here is that uh, you can actually, uh, once you get somewhere, click on a parcel, get a handful of, uh, of the attributes that we discussed earlier for a general plan land use uh, in a SCAG code and a, a city code if applicable. Um, zone density and, and existing land use as well, and, and a few other details. And this is where we'll be placing a handful of other uh, pieces of attribute information. Uh, as I mentioned, that's currently in development right now. Certainly with the overlay feature, uh, fairly straightforward to be able to see whether something is in or out of an HPCA. Uh, and, and even there's some filtering ability here, uh, even in this, uh, this, this really uh, free, currently accessible uh, Esri web viewer. Uh, for example, one of the site standards from HCD for low income sites uh, per the uh, June guidance that was issued uh, is that, uh, you know, barring additional justification, uh, low income sites should be between 0.5 and 10 acres. Um, so I can apply a filter there and just like, search for my sites that are uh, between 0.5 and 10 acres. Uh, I could even add another expression. For example, if I want to look at specifically uh, vacant sites, I could use uh, land use 2016 starts with a three. So if you actually were uh, looking a little bit more deeply at the land use coding system, you could see um, the uh, vacant, one of the more common vacant categories starts with a three, 3,000 and, and beyond. There's also 1,900, but just for the sake of brevity, um, I'm just gonna do a really quick assessment of sites of this certain size um, uh, that are currently listed uh, as vacant or some sort of vacant. Uh, and uh, I can see here on the map, the ones within a high quality transit area. So just a really quick, uh, quick, quick and dirty way. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I apologize for making you all use your imagination a little bit here, uh, but imagine a sleeker platform for this, uh, including some of the additional attributes, uh, overlays, and guidance. Uh, but the, the logic is fairly similar with, um, uh, with uh, uh, reviewed parcel level data and a handful of, of pieces of information like that that are, uh, that are linked to the housing element standards. So I'm going to go back uh, I apologize, I, I unshared my screen. I had intended to return to the presentation. Um, and, and talk just for the last few minutes here of my time about some of the additional uh, attributes that we have under development. Um, certainly site size, public ownership, I heard that was mentioned as, as one of the requirements. Uh, we have a few location scores uh, for access to, to various things. Um, and uh, SCAG previously had conducted some studies and analyses on infill potential. Uh, there was a, a joint author paper with the Orange County Business Council. Uh, in addition, just uh, some exploratory uh, uh, infill, uh, you know, parcels, potential infill parcels uh, using basically uh, assessor improvements to land value ratio. So the intuition is that uh, uh, if a land value is uh, in a relative sense fairly high compared to the value of the improvements, uh, then that would have a, a low improvement to land value ratio. Just one way to kind of look at uh, the potential repurposability of, of currently non-vacant sites. Uh, so these, this is just a smattering of, of uh, things that we're uh, that we're intending to include here, largely from uh, uh, from these parcel level data sets, um, and then some calculations based on that, and some other publicly available data. Great, and Kevin, uh, you have about two minutes. That is perfect. Thank you, Lyle. Appreciate it. Uh, there are some other additional overlays uh, that we're putting uh, uh, into this as well. Uh, there was a discussion on AFFH. Now I know, understand we're still waiting a couple of months probably for a little bit more detailed descriptions uh, on, um, uh, on the HCD side for AFFH, but uh, certainly TCAC opportunity scores, as I've mentioned, are likely to be a, a component of that. Uh, environmental justice uh, area is also another way to kind of analyze the uh, intra-urban geography uh, within a local jurisdiction. Uh, some environmental constraints, we're actually working with the Nature Conservancy to get a few more uh, kind of interesting uh, layers uh, into this as part of a kind of a, a longer time frame uh, regional green print initiative. Uh, in addition, certainly proximity to transit is there. Uh, I did want to make a quick side note, um, you know, as you may have paid attention to SCAG's RENA process, the, the methodology for allocating a RENA number to a local jurisdiction did use um, um, that jurisdiction's share of the, of the regional HPTA population to allocate some uh, needs to the jurisdiction. Uh, however, I do want to clarify, um, while we are including uh, HPTA's high quality transit as a layer here, um, that does not uh, indicate, you know, no nothing in the RENA methodology indicates where within a local jurisdiction um, um, uh, units uh, should be placed for any, for any reason. Uh, this, is, this is a tool for, uh, for local jurisdictions to use at their disposal uh, for, for set inventory purposes. So, um, just to do a quick wrap up again, kind of our objectives, uh, make our data more available, more useful for housing element updates, 
I would expect uh, uh, these pre-certified housing needs data to be available very, very shortly. Please check out our open data portal uh, if you're interested in kind of learning more about what's going to be available soon. Uh, and within a few months, uh, we aim to have uh, uh, a quick, lightweight web application uh, that will do uh, what I just described here. So uh, please uh, let me know if you've got any questions. Uh, my own email or housing at skeg.ca.gov. I'll be on leave for a little while, so housing may be a better bet. Uh, but I think I'll turn it back to Lyle with that. Great. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great presentation and demonstration of the open data that we have available online right now. Um, next, we have Sohab and Paul from HCD. Um, Sohab, feel free to take it over. Great. Um, do you want me to share my screen or can you? Uh, would you mind sharing your screen? I can do that. Yeah. Give me one Great. second. Let's see. So can I get an okay? You can see a PowerPoint slide? Yep, I can see it. Great. Um, okay. not in full screen. You want to yeah. yeah. All good? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Soha Mahmood. I work with HPD, HCD in the Housing Policy Division. You guys hopefully know me by now. Um, so I'm going to present on technical assistance that HCD is providing around housing policy in general. Um, we hope that a lot of our technical assistance is going to complement and support the efforts that SCAG is doing around data. So just to give a little bit of background, a lot of you guys probably already know this by now, but and the context for why we're bringing, it, we're bringing in so much technical assistance is because since 2017, up until today, we've had a lot of changes in housing law in general, um, specifically around housing elements, but a lot of push to make sure that local governments are starting to implement policies and programs and strategies that accelerate housing production. And as part of the first, the first wave of this was the legislative housing package of 2017 that had 15 new housing bills, such as SB 35 and also SB 2, which included the SB 2 planning grants. Um, that was our first wave of funding to local governments, cities, and counties for yeah, funding for planning um, around housing. Then we had in 2019-2020 the Budget Act that came with Governor Newsom, and that included another sweep of funding mechanisms, but also accountability measures around housing elements or housing in general. Um, so with the Budget Act, we had LEAP, which is the Local Early Action Planning Grants. I think, you know, we have close to 430 applications, but we have grants for 539 jurisdictions. So if you are the one of those who have not applied yet, please still do. There still is time to apply until January 1st. Feel free to contact our team or contact me directly, and we can help you guys apply for those grants. Um, again, these are planning, another wave of planning grants to help you update plans and documents and implement process improvements and strategies to accelerate housing production. We also had REAP funding that was available through the Budget Act, um, and REAP funding is dead, targeted towards regional government, so SCAG, ABAG, other regional entities to also help local governments uh, develop and uh, start aligning strategies to produce housing in their region. Also, we're coming out with pro-housing regulations. Pro-housing is a new program, again, through the Budget Act, that basically designates cities and counties who have land use and housing policies that are friendly to housing development in their community. There's gonna be a lot more guidance on that along with technical assistance. And that's what I'm gonna talk about a lot today is how we're providing the technical assistance that comes with updating your housing elements, implementing housing policies, addressing new housing laws, um, also implementing the funding you're receiving through LEAP and SB2, and possibly applying for a pro-housing designation. So how can we help? So about two years ago with the SB2 planning grants, we also launched an Accelerating Housing Production Technical Assistance Program. So the first phase of that program, hopefully many of you are familiar with, was the SB2 TA program where we provided direct assistance to all applicants who would like to access and apply for an SB2 planning grant. Uh, if you guys are familiar for SCAG region, most of it was your regional liaisons were through PlaceWorks, Colin Drucker, uh, Jenny, Jonathan Nettler. These people hopefully you guys are familiar with because you might have reached out to them on how to apply for the planning grant. 
we, our goal was to make sure that all cities and counties can access this funding source because it's meant for all of the cities and counties in California. So we provided direct TA through our PlaceWorks contract to all cities and counties through the SB2 Planning Grants Program. I believe through that program we received 490 grant applications, which is almost or more than 90% of the straight state. So that was a great turnout. But now, part now that phase one kind of is, is done, we're rolling into phase two of our program. So it wasn't just that we wanted to help you apply for this funding source, but we want to be with you ongoing for the next couple of years as you're updating your, um, as you're implementing, using your funding and implementing other housing policies. So now we're moving into phase two, which is our ongoing regionally tailored TA program. What that means is we come in at a regional level, and in this case, a sub-regional level because GAG is so large, and we tailor a technical assistance program around housing policy to your sub-regional needs. And I'll go into more detail of what that potentially looks like. So our timing for this is 2020 and possibly until 2000, it says 2022, but possibly into 2023 or longer. We've supplemented this existing phase two program with additional funding and technical assistance resources. Right now we have a budget around, we put out an RFP for I, I believe somewhere around $4.5 million to acquire more technical assistance provider, service providers to again start reaching the entire state and help you guys with all of your TA needs around housing. Our goal with this program now, the ongoing regional TA program, is to regionally customize a set of TA resources and tools to meet your unique housing needs. So the reason why I say the unique housing needs and we're regionalizing, uh, we're, we're customizing this regional program is because at the state, we decided we don't wanna come in with, here's the five things we think you need, here are the five tools, good luck. We wanna come in with, what are your needs and how can we help you? We're hoping to implement a very bottoms up approach in this TA program. So rather than assuming we know what you need, assuming we think we know how to fix it, we want to come in and understand from all of you guys, what, what could you use, use and what do you need when you're implementing these new housing policies and updating your housing element and using your LEAP and SB2 grant funding. So, oops. So this is just an example of phase one of our technical assistance program. Kevin, I saw you had your picture on there, so I had to put mine on your slide, on my slides. Um, but phase one, again, like I said, we provided direct assistance to over 400 jurisdictions. We did over 30 workshops. We traveled the entire state of California, everywhere from Mammoth Lakes to Coachella Valley to San Diego to all the way up to Siskiyou County um, so that we can reach every region in the state of California to make sure they have access to this funding. There's Paul there, our PlaceWorks contractors are also there, um, as well as the rest of our team. That is not Paul. That, it is Paul. He, he's afraid that people are gonna start identifying his face, so he tries to hide it, but it's Paul. <laughs> so anyways, now we're going into phase two. So what's our first step to phase two of our TA program? Our first step is to do regional outreach and engagement with all of you guys. So at this, at this phase, we're actually going to be doing sub-regional outreach. We're going to be re reaching out to each sub-region, sub-regional um, entity in SCAG area, and we're going to be asking to send out a survey and reaching out to the sub-regional jurisdictions on what do they need for TA. So be aware that you might get a survey um, from your sub-region with SCAG and with HCD and with PlaceWorks on kind of solicitating feedback on if you know if you had a wish list of all the things you could possibly need in the next couple of years to implement housing policies for your community what would that wish list be so second all of that feedback all of that information we're going to gather all those results they're going to be fed into regional ta plans so for example uh san bernardino and wr cog they're going to have their very own state issued regional ta plan with all the resources and all the toolkits that we're going to be de dedicating and committing to that region and then from that regional TA plan, we'll go into deploying those tools and resources that they've asked for. So now what can be put in this regional TA plan? So here's an example. I put ABAG, sorry, I, I should change it to SCAG. But anyways, an example of what a region could ask for. Um, there could be web-based zoning tools. There could be training and um, building support for housing. So maybe a public engage, we can help develop and frame a public engagement campaign because we understand that adopting some of these policies in the next couple of years may be difficult. And to build support, build um, campaigns around 
housing and, and to build that support, community support for when you're adopting these policies. It could be toolkits on a variety of issues. You know, we've heard things across the board of what does it actually mean to rezone? How do you actually do that at the staff level? How, how can we do some of these things in-house? What does it mean? How can we update our housing element? Can we do some of these pieces, update pieces of our housing element in-house? So really creating toolkits to provide more guidance, to provide clarity on how to implement certain housing policies, and to provide more subject matter expertise at the local level. Um, your regional priorities. You as a sub-region will determine what are your priorities at region? What are the maybe three to five top things you want to tackle as a sub-region, and also as a region as a whole? But again, like I said, we'll be coming at the sub-regional level. So because SCAG is so different from Imperial County to LA County, what your needs and your priorities may be very different. And we'll be trying to understand what is it that you want to prioritize. And again, how can we develop those tools to help you? Of course, I'm sure with every TA plan, we want technical assistance on housing elements. And that is definitely going to be part of it. Regardless if you come create a TA plan with us or not, we will have technical assistance on housing elements. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like. So technical assistance, so again, what can go in this regional-based TA plan? It could be customized toolkits, could be model ordinances, something we're working on right now. It could be housing workshops, again, to build subject matter expertise, maybe housing workshops with your community to build support for housing topics. Um, it could be consulting benches that you can pull from to get um, specific advice on a particular topic. Definitely TA around housing elements. Um, TA around public engagement, and that will all be determined through your TA plan and the feedback you give us to put into your TA plan. But also, on a we have our regional TA program, but we also have our statewide TA program. These are tools that we're developing on a statewide level for everyone, regardless. We've created, we've developed these statewide, or we're developing these statewide tools because we've heard throughout the state that these are top things that everybody or close to everyone really needs. So these are statewide toolkits on objective design and development standards. Right now our, our team of, at PlaceWorks is working on a how-to guide on developing objective design and development standards. It's a toolkit on ADUs, a toolkit on public engagement. We have a suite of model ordinances that will be coming your way. We'll be working with SCAG to make sure everyone gets them. And so the suite of model ordinances, for example, are sample ordinances on topics like density bonus, ADU, supportive housing, reasonable accommodation. These are all ordinances that you probably regularly update due to changes in state law. And basically they're model ordinances that you can pull from, customize a little bit for your jurisdiction, and adopt. And again, this is our goal is to help provide more clarity with the law, help um, maybe lessen costs so you don't have to call a consultant every time you need to update your ordinance provide more certainty that when a law changes that will part of that ordinance will include the changes in that law and again to provide that overall support while you're updating your ordinances and other policies um, throughout the next couple years we'll also have mapping tools for example in CEQA that was something that OPR um, and her team Helen and her team at OPR developed and we'll have direct assistance on LEAP and REAP which um, hopefully most of you guys have already received through our in-house LEAP team so upcoming tools and technical assistance specific to housing elements. So I've talked about, again, a suite of tools that will come around various housing policy topics like ADUs, objective design standards, CEQA, rezoning, how, um, rezoning, other public engagement. But we do and we are looking at a very specific TA around housing elements. And I know that's probably what you're all wanting to hear. Um, so we're going to be doing that at both the statewide level, providing housing element TA, and also at the regional and sub-regional level. So one thing is updating our building blocks. If you guys visited HCD's website on housing elements, or right now our building, spot, building blocks website, on its, which is our guide for housing elements, doesn't incorporate a lot of the new laws and the new changes in laws in the last couple years. So our building blocks is currently at this moment being updated in the next month to incorporate new laws on um, the new changes in housing element law. Housing element webinars and workshops, again, this is something that we can determine through your sub-regional TA plan. But basically, an example I will give you is with SANDAG, we, your San Diego counterpart, um, we did a eight-month eight housing element workshops. So every month, we went into SANDAG. Most of it had to be done virtually. But we'd go in, we would meet with all SANDAG jurisdictions, we would present on one policy topic around housing elements, 
So for example, we would present for about an hour and a half on sites inventory. And then we would break out into one-on-one -on -one sessions with SANDAG jurisdictions to talk about some of the unique challenges they might be facing and to brainstorm through some of the issues that they're working through when updating their housing element. And then the second half of the day, pre-COVID, we would do site visits with those jurisdictions to kind of get a good idea and get some context about the community so that when we're reviewing their housing element, we fully understand what we're looking at when, we're, when they're sharing information with us and we're brainstorming and being collaborative with each jurisdiction while they're updating their housing element. Um, again, if this is something you're interested in, this is definitely things that we can brainstorm through your TA plan. Another example of the trainings that we're working with, um, working with SCAG to work on, which are trainings around different, again, different housing element topics, some that we, uh, we did earlier today, but also maybe more in-depth training on housing element topics. Also, we'll be working on a suite of sample analysis and tools that accompany all of our guidebooks, our sites inventory, our AFFH guidebook, any guides and, and memos that we put out around specific parts of the housing element law, we want to accompany that with sample tools and analysis you can use where essentially the goal is you can plug in that analysis into your housing element, customize it for your needs and your jurisdiction, and then use that as a pre-filtered way to, to update that section of your housing element. So an example of a sample analysis and tools was the pre-certified housing data or housing, um, housing data that Kevin presented on. Another example that we're looking at is maybe a pre-certified ADU affordability analysis when you're using ADUs to count towards your arena. So again, these are, these are tools that give you a little bit more certainty as to what HCD is looking for when you're updating your housing element and that the tools will incorporate all of the new changes in the law. Also, again, um, this is the same thing, coordination with all COGS, in this case, coordination with SCAG on any pre-approved analysis and data package, what, much of what um, Kevin just presented on earlier. And like I said, toolkits on a variety of housing policy areas. Really, our goal here is to, one, provide customized TA to each subregion to make sure we're supporting you throughout your housing element update and implementing any housing policies. Again, we have a very robust program that we're working on right now to make sure we reach all of you and support you through these efforts. Here's a flyer, um, PlaceWorks, our, our technical assistance providers, put together on the upcoming tools that will be coming your way. So a housing portal specific to that's going to host and have all the toolkits that we're talking about. It's hopefully going to be very user friendly, very interactive make it easy for you guys to, to kind of pull from model ordinances and other topics um, from this housing portal. I know sometimes um, HC's website can be a little antiquated, so this is hopefully to modernize that. Um, land inventory samples, the CEQA site check uh, tool that OPR presented on, like I mentioned, a how-to guide on objective standards, um, an ADU web map and toolkit where it includes an ADU web-based zoning clearance tool, um, and, and just again, other tools that we're working on that we hope to hopefully have all out by the end of fall. So this is a, a link on our, our mapping that we have for the SB2 planning grants. I believe most of you guys are probably familiar with this, but um, feel free to, when you get a copy of this PowerPoint, check out our maps. It's, um, right now, it's a map that hosts all of the SB2 planning grant, grant applications that most of them where you can link, uh, choose a city and then get to see what they applied for. And in the future, it will have LEAP, it will have REAP, it will have all of our technical assistance resources on this map. And basically the goal is really with this map to kind of facilitate a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment where you can go ahead and see, huh, I wonder what policies my neighbor is implementing and can I learn from them? Or I'm really curious on, you know, how are some cities implementing rezoning policies and I would like to get some feedback from them or learn from what they're doing and it's just a way to see what your neighbors are doing see what similar cities are doing in your region or in different regions and to learn from and the goal is that we have people's contact info and website links so that you can easily go there and call somebody up and, and be like hey I saw you're doing this policy or you're working on this or you have this RFP out can you help me out on this particular area so I recommend you guys checking it out um, but I, I believe most people are familiar. I know I've um, presented on this map a couple times. So for more information on the LEAP and REAP program, uh, again, especially if you have not applied for your LEAP grant, your local early action planning grant, please, please contact our team so we can get you that funding. 
Um, we have till January to have you apply, but why not apply as soon as possible so you can get that money? Um, contact our early action planning at hcd.ca.gov. If you have questions on our pro housing program, uh, right now we're working on our emergency regulations to kind of set forth the guidelines on how to apply and what that program looks like. You can contact our pro housing team. And any questions you might have on technical assistance or resources that we have available or will be available, you can feel free to contact me directly. So Kevin Skagg, I'll hand it back over to you guys. Great, thank you, Sohab. We appreciate all the comments. Um, we are now open to joining or going into our Q&A session. Um, I've been monitoring the chat. Looks like we've had a few questions. Some have been already answered, but uh, I will be posing a few of them for you right now. So the first one we had is, is there a timeline for the release of mentioned statewide toolkits? Sure, there is a timeline. So if we wanna talk about the very first toolkit, which is those model ordinances, we are actually in our final review process of those ordinances. And as soon as that review process is over, we will get them posted on our website. I've been saying at the latest, mid-September, at the earliest, um, the end of August or the first week of September. Um, I always say at the latest, just because sometimes things can get held up, but that's our hope. Again, we will be working with SCAG and everyone to make sure once that stuff is available that you guys all hear about it. Great. That's uh, That kind of answers one of the next questions is, is uh, when can they use the public engagement TA? Sure. Uh, so, so using any TA, so like I said, the public engagement TA, even a little bit on the housing element TA, is going to be determined based on your TA plan. So when we're right now doing outreach, we're working on getting our outreach going for developing your TA plan. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to contact your subregion. So maybe in this case, San Bernardino, COG, or uh, Western Riverside COG, or CBAG. We'll contact your subregion. We'll let them know that we have a survey ready for your jurisdictions within that subregion. Within that survey, you want to definitely indicate, hey, I'm really interested in getting more TA on public engagement and some support around that area. And as soon as we finalize that survey and the results, we feed it into a TA plan, we'll start deploying those resources. We hope to have all of that ready to go, the survey results, the TA plan finalized. Uh, and, and, and I should add, the TA plan is, is a living document. So at any time in the next couple years, you want to change something or you're like, oh, I don't really need TA around this area. I, I need to start, I would like some more TA around this area. That's a living document that can always be changed. It's your plan, you know, it's not, us telling you what to do, it's you telling us what you need. Um, but again, we hope to have resources and TA plans starting to be finalized in the next two months. Great, thank you. Um, one of the next questions is, is uh, there is a jurisdiction that is updating their ADU ordinance. Okay. Um, do you anticipate any changes in the near future? So we can't really anticipate any changes because a lot of that is, um, is determined by the legislature. Um, if you're wondering if you, if you need help or you uh, need to incorporate the new ADU laws right now into your ADU ordinance, feel free to reach out to our team. We have a TA team on ADU, ADUs and ADU ordinances that can help you update. But we can't really uh, anticipate what the legislature might do around ADU laws. Great, thank you. I'll make a um, quick plug on that. Uh, I, I did get another private question in the chat. Uh, we, we have also worked on an ADU uh, affordability study, uh, kind of a, a both SCAG and HCD worked on this together for uh, assessing the, uh, the appropriate income level uh, for ADUs for the RENA purposes. Uh, and this would just be kind of a safe harbor assumption, certainly uh, any, in any instance, additional data or additional analysis that's local, uh, you know, does, does tend to be more robust if you can get a better sample. But uh, we'll be discussing that next week at the All About ADUs session too. So another, another uh, TA mm -hmm. thing uh, coming online soon. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, another question we have is kind of related to COVID. Um, due to the pandemic, there has been some significant issues with outreach and uh, garnering public engagement. Um, sure. So given that other fairly recent legislation is only now being implemented for the first time, given the situation and challenges with outreach in a virtual world that may leave out segments of the population, despite best outreach efforts, has the state considered taking a time out and building in some additional time for completion of the housing element? Sure, so two parts, I think I have two, two parts to this question is one virtual engagement um, or, or outreach, virtual outreach right now during this pandemic, we are providing, we're, we're 
um, developing a lot of guidance and hope and that webinar that I talked to help give more guidance on what is our expectations to doing outreach during this time and also how can you engage in, in virtual engagement. We also understand that while you're doing your best, you're putting forth your best effort to engage the public, you may not be getting that feedback and then what to do in that situation where you're not getting the feedback you want to see in your housing element. So a lot of that stuff will be addressed on our September 1st webinar and also we are working on some guidance, some some more detailed guidance on how to, how to work through that. So the second about the housing element timings during a pandemic, housing element due dates are determined by statute and statute is written by the legislator. So HCD does not have authority to change statute, nor does it have authority to extend deadlines, especially because that was determined by statute. Our work, our, our um, efforts are to just get you to that deadline and do anything we possibly can to help support your efforts. But as far as things um, you know, pertaining to changing that deadline, that has to be taken up um, or that has to be addressed through the legislator. Yeah, I can comment on this just a little bit. You know, um, SCAG, in addition to a couple of the other MPOs, uh, have been uh, putting a little bit of advocacy effort uh, in, into this uh, in order to kind of daylight some of these issues about the fact that it's uh, exceptionally hard uh, to do outreach in this fairly short uh, time frame with a lot of other considerations. Uh, but as so have mentioned, you know, ultimately it is uh, an issue for the state legislature. Uh, and we're, you know, operating under the assumption that uh, given the, the very narrow time window uh, left remaining on this session, uh, that uh, we're, we're still just operating under the assumption of, of, of the, uh, the deadline as stated. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, another question we have is, is there any consideration as to how housing should be built now that we are in a pandemic era and just might want to uh, have a little fresh air and land around our houses? Sure. I think um, Paul has kind of some feedback on that question. So I'll let Paul take this one because he's been yearning to talk all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm really not sure is, are, are, what, what's being asked there. Is there a way we could kind of get some clarification? Yeah, the question was asked, um, let me see. From Holly Osborne? Yes. Yeah, that was me. Do uh, you want me to say something? Yeah, do you want to yeah. clarify oh, a little bit? Right. So, you know, when you have a certain amount of density and then you have to put it on your lot and sometimes it, it makes your, your lot uh, solid concrete, okay? And that, that just didn't, that didn't help at times like this. Nobody wants their backyard to have three other units and it's crammed in there with solid concrete, which is what some of those uh, bills are coming through now. So, so you're advocating for less density, as we're seeing because of our pandemic. Yes. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I haven't heard uh, too many conversations around that, but I gotta guess. You know, as we move forward, uh, um, that there will be some innovation in how we, you know, uh, um, look at our land use patterns. You know, from a variety of perspective, whether it be pandemic or climate change, and try our best to to uh, balance those 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 important objectives. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm looking through the chat. Um, oh, well, go ahead. There an, yeah, there was another question about um, hearing back from HCD on your LEAP grant. So everybody has been assigned a LEAP reviewer. So if you're looking for, you can really just reach out to your LEAP reviewer, say, hey, where, is your, where, um, where are you in the process of my SB2 grant, uh, sorry, my LEAP grant. But if you don't know your LEAP reviewer, just feel free to email me directly or you can email earlyactionplanning at acd.ca.gov, which I'm on the other side of that and just say, hey, I'm looking for an update on my LEAP application. Can you um, get me to my reviewer? And I'd be happy to make that introduction. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions I think we've already covered is, uh, is there a grace period for the housing element update deadline? Um, that's been covered. Um, are there any minimum standards for open space and dense areas, minimum traffic related of evals of VMT, parking, et cetera? Sure, I'm not aware of any minimum standards, but Paul, maybe you are. Minimum standards for open space and dense areas. I mean, usually uh, open space requirements are set locally. 
Is there is there anything in housing on the laws? That's is that the question? If so, normally you would list uh, um, you would list your various land use controls. Those could be development standards and analyze those as potential constraints. But uh, my understanding is that um, that's local governments uh, through their zoning would would establish those standards. Great, Denny, did you have a follow up with that? I, I know that you were the one that posed the question. Well, the reason I'm asking the question is because, quite frankly, uh, as I understand it, the national average is four acres per thousand people. The city of LA's goal is three. The reality is is around two or less, and my area is 0 0.7, with none in the entire eastern half. And there's no plan coming to add to it. So I just wondered if there was any minimum standards. Um, I mean, there's there's laws around park requirements. I believe that's the Quimby Act as well as, you know, and those and there can be park dedication uh, types of requirements as well. But uh, again, a lot of that is locally uh, um, enforced and planned through the general plan. Well, even the Quimby funds aren't used locally. They're, they're in the city of LA, but the city of LA is huge. Gotcha. Yeah, again, um, at a state level, I mean, a lot of that stuff is going to be planned at the local. Thing we need is more density here. We're already bumper to bumper. It takes as much as five signals to get out of my neighborhood. But we're adding to it. That's I, I why I asked about the vehicle miles traveled. Because yeah, as we add people, we're adding vehicle miles traveled. I appreciate the comment. Thank you. I, I am able to provide one quick answer to uh, one of the questions from Barbara um, uh, in terms of calculations of open space in a particular area. Uh, uh, Viro screen is probably one of the more comprehensive uh, data sets on this. Uh, they all, uh, there's also a linkage to the CPAD or California Protective Areas database. Um, those are things that we're looking at being able to, to patch into to our tool. I think they do make a, an appearance in OPR SQL site check as well. Uh, so there, there's definitely an ability to kind of analyze that uh, as you're going through through sites through some of those data sources. And then, uh, sorry, just to add really quick to the question about is there a link available for the September 1st webinar? I think I can maybe potentially work with SCAG um, and send out a link to the this entire mailing list and we'll get you that link as soon as we can. Great. Thank you, Suab. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, we will take in the rest of the questions that come through um, and we will uh, sort them out and allow our panelists to be able to respond to those uh, at a later date. Um, without that, I would like to hand it off to Mayan Johnson. Great, All right, thanks, Lyle. And uh, that was really a great panel and hopefully um, the attendees today, I hope uh, you can use a lot of this information and resources from both SCAG and HCD when preparing your housing elements. So. Um, let's give them a round of applause. All right, um, so uh, <laughs> with that, uh, that brings us to the conclusion of day one of the Housing Element Workshop. And I wanna thank you for hanging on uh, for a few minutes, uh, extra minutes today. Um, there's a lot of great questions and while we couldn't get to all of them, uh, we'll make sure to include them. Um, we'll post them uh, with answers from our panelists um, and also the recording um, along with the presentations from our panelists today. Um, there was also an issue, I believe, with the Zoom to YouTube stream. Um, so may, many of your colleagues were unable to join us um, with the stream. Uh, so we'll have the recording of today's session posted as soon as possible. Um, in preparation for next week, um, if you'd like to email any questions, you can do so in advance. Send them again to housing at skag.ca.gov. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone again for participating today, and we will see you next week for part two on August 27th. So have a great day and stay cool.